Episode 321 Loneliness in the Eyes of Sam The last time she saw the child was at the amusement park. Despite the mother-son pair being apart for seven years and only meeting once, she felt very close to him. A mother and a child were connected at heart. Indeed, blood was thicker than water. He was her flesh and blood. In those seven years, not once had she seen this child, but her longing for him had not abated, even for a moment. That day, when Sam aggrievedly complained to Monica that his father did not want him anymore, Monica's heart broke into fragments. Her heart ached for the child. When Andres was much younger, Monica did her in-depth research on children's psychology. Andres only had her for a mother. He never knew who his father was. The moment he started kindergarten, he pestered her about the identity of his father. Each time, her heart would ache badly. Regarding the boy, she had always been striving hard. He only had her alone, and without a father, the family was incomplete from the start. Hence, she had done her best to create a happy childhood for him. She did not wish for him to become a troubled orphan. Luckily, Andres was sensible and well-behaved. He eventually stopped asking Monica about his father. The two of them relied on each other through the years. Under her effort, his childhood was not lonely. However, that day at the amusement park, when she met Sam, she saw the undisguised loneliness in his eyes. Lonely. The child looked very lonely. This came to her as a surprise. He was different from Andres. Sam, who was born with a silver spoon, was destined to be loved by everyone. The younger twin had no father, whereas the older twin had a father and a mother. Logically, the child should not be so lonely, but should possess a happy and remarkable childhood instead. Surprisingly, she saw loneliness and emptiness in his eyes that day. Her heart was torn badly and in extreme pain thereafter. He was akin to a little beast curling up in a corner to nurse its wound alone. There was also astonishment in her heart. How on earth had the child survived these seven years? Did Stefan not love him enough? However, after learning of Gracia's real character, she had a chance to correct that misconception. That woman naturally did not pour effort into Sam. After all, he was no child of hers. It was not her flesh and blood entirely. With regard to Sam, how could she expect Gracia to have any maternal instinct? Did she actually expect her to treat him as hers and love him unconditionally? Presumably, for the sake of Stefan, that woman took charge of Sam as a son for show. The child was sensitive, though, and acutely perceived the adult's motive. It was clear that the two were not close. As for Stefan, being the boy's father, he naturally raised him in strict discipline. In the child's mind, if the mother was a gentle harbor, the father should assume a stern and magnificent image, a superhero. There was no doubt that Stefan was very strict when it came to Sam's education. The child was really impressive. Having witnessed his skills at the haunted house that day, she could say that the boy was truly amazing, even when comparable to an adult. Despite being just a seven-year-old, he already assumed the role of a man. The little lad perfectly inherited his father's overbearing aura and drive. Although he was young, he had a very reliable image. Monica wanted to make up to the child properly. He registered the plea and caution in her eyes in his. He could not help but recall that day at the hospital. When she left with Andres in her arms, Sam chased after them to the door. Tears flowed down the boy's face. Clearly, he was reluctant to part with them. Sometimes, blood ties were incredibly profound. 
She did not know this, but the man knew. It was not that Gracia did not try to enter the boy's heart. Alas, that woman's flattery and pampering were not enough to touch the deepest part of the boy's heart. In contrast, Monica and Sam had merely spent half a day together, yet the boy had clearly accepted her in his heart already. Ever since he was much younger, that child had always been cold on the outside and warm on the inside. This trait was very similar to him. He was the same when he was still a child. He was not close to anyone other than his mother, and after her death, he completely sealed off his heart from anybody. As for his son, with the exception of him, his interaction with others was always a bit frosty. The boy was never close to anyone. He even shied away from his great-grandfather, Peter Lewis, who loved him to the core. He sealed himself shut in his own world. As the boy's father, he was extremely strict with him. At the tender age of four, the little boy was thrown into a special boot camp by his father, whereby he had undergone hellish training. To him, the child was to be revered, yet he also longed for them to be close. He was regrettably usually swamped with work and could not handle every aspect of child care, though. Thus, it was inevitable for him to neglect interacting with the child often. He laughed bitterly to himself at the thought of this. It seemed that he was quite an unqualified father. His eyes drooped. Looking at the woman in his arms, he mildly replied, Of course you can. She was stunned by his consent. Staring with wide eyes at him, she was a little wary of this unexpected consensus. Really? Did this man really agree to her request so easily? She found it to be unbelievable. She was a woman who knew her limitations and how to adapt to circumstances. She loved the boy very much, but having signed that contract with this man before, she was never forgetful of it. The clauses in the contract required her to renounce all her custody rights to Sam. It was different now, though. This man had promised to give her the whole world, his entire world. She did not expect too much, just wanted a family. She just wished for a home with him and the two kids. She was only expecting him to, at most, agree to her occasionally visiting his son. Little did she think that he would make such a firm promise. Her heart was filled with sweetness in that instant. He smiled at her. Why not? That child was their child. Neither hers alone, nor his alone. Sam was both their child. She was the boy's biological mother. Why would she not be allowed to see him? Oh, thank you. She smiled with contentment. Just like this? He flicked his gaze onto her. Apparently, he was unsatisfied with those two simple words. Thank you? He did not need a verbal expression of gratitude. She was not enlightened in this aspect, and she could not grasp his underlying meaning. There was a saying that went, A woman's heart is as deep as the bottom of the sea. What she did not know was that a man's heart was even deeper than the sea itself. This was especially the case for a scheming man like this one before her. He was even more unfathomable and unpredictable than most of his counterparts. He raised his chin slightly and narrowed his eyes. His meaning could not be any more obvious. She finally understood what he meant through this action of his. This man really was a kissing maniac. He seemed incapable of having enough kisses. Episode 322 I have known about it for seven years now. Monica looped her arms around Stefan's neck and tightly locked lips with him. 
cradling her head in his palm. He deepened their kiss, soft and deeply. His lips were very reluctant to part with hers. She was just thinking that she might suffocate when the kiss ended hastily. She proceeded to nestle languidly in his embrace, just like a contented little kit. Suddenly, recalling something, she started to speak. Stefan. As these words left her mouth, the man's gaze lightly landed on her face. She blushed and whispered softly, Steph. The man smiled satisfactorily. Sam, I've seen his impressive skills. Did you give him training? He admitted. Yes. Put him in a military boot camp when he was four. He's been training ever since then. Cheetah Commando Unit. It was the world's best special force combat legion. The rigorous training undergone by its cadets was totally on another level. The average soldiers could not compare to these special forces vanguards in terms of combat capabilities. That was the true meaning of being a vanguard. It was not much to say that one tasted blood at gunpoint. She was left speechless by this. No wonder that child's skill is so sick. You've been training him like that since he was four? The man's lips twitched slightly. Did this woman just tell him that Sam was sick? What was Andre's then? Sam possessed impressive skills because he had received special guidance and grooming in that field. He had also put in a lot of effort on the child. What about Andre's? That child was the true horror. He was the true meaning of self-taught. He was practically a prodigy in the world of entrepreneurship. Tell that she had only treated him as a normal seven-year-old child. Moreover, she had not signed the kid up for any special class. Nonetheless, that child still evolved naturally. He was barely seven years old, but he already had a few billion under his name. This was the true meaning of sick, all right. Compared to him, in terms of capability, Sam could be deemed as normal. This woman was not paying attention to the strange light in the man's eyes, though, and only nagged further. The child is still so young. By imposing so much training on him, it'll only curb his development. Seven years old is the age when he should be carefree. It's time to let him have an unfettered childhood. Sam is very talented in the suspect since before, he mildly said and actually prefers fiddling with firearms rather than watching cartoons. In fact, he's more into seeing military-themed movies and documentaries. She was clearly surprised by this. He glanced at her and smiled. That child, if properly groomed, will be a talented soldier. Of the twins, one was an entrepreneurial genius, and another one was a military talent. With their respective fortes, they complemented each other well. Jeans were indeed extraordinary. She shook her head in shock. Well, I still think that Sam's ability is too thick. It's really unscientific for a child to have skills comparable to an adult. The man's brows twitched violently. <gasps> Stupid woman. Compared to Andres, that little demon king, Sam could not be considered as sick, but a little angel instead. The older twin's skills might be formidable, but his mental state was not far from those his age. Meanwhile, the IQ and EQ of Andres were no longer at the category of children. She merely had yet to witness that boy's demonic side. He, on the other hand, had experienced it firsthand. That was a truly scary experience, if you must say. Stefan and Monica kept their silence for a good while. She could not bear this, however. For a long time, there was doubt in her heart, and she always wanted to verify it with him, but there had been no chance to do so. She pondered on this for a while, and decided that she still wanted to clarify things. Stefan, may I ask you a question? Monica voiced out abruptly. Okay, shoot your question. She sat ramrod straight and faced him calmly. 
You probably know by now of my identity. He was startled, but soon figured out what she meant. After much deliberation, he decided to confess. Found out about your identity seven years ago. Monica was shocked. It had not occurred to her that he would know of her identity for that long. How did you learn of my identity? DNA. He looked up. Have you forgotten? Seven years ago, before signing that surrogacy contract, you did a blood test. Your sample report showed that you belong to the MNSU blood group. That blood type is extremely rare. In fact, it's the rarest among all the other blood types. She frowned slightly. Her blood type was indeed extremely rare in this world. Still, based on my blood type alone, how could you ascertain that I'm the daughter of Elizabeth Lewis? She asked. You do know that coincidences happen, right? What if this is one such coincidence? He looked at her and blurted out. The two of you look very much alike. They were truly similar. Their temperament and grace were especially hard to replicate. Putting her and Elizabeth's photos side by side, no one would doubt that they were mother and daughter. This was based on what he could remember of the image of her mother's younger self. When her mother departed from the Lewis family, it was already five, and could accurately retain memories. Although the other memories of her mother were vague, her beautiful looks left an indelible impression on him. When he saw her photo seven years ago, he felt a sense of familiarity. Only upon chancing on a photo of Elizabeth's younger self in his grandfather's study that his suspicions were confirmed. Hence, he secretly ordered the hospital to run a maternity test on Monica's blood sample. DNA database has your mother's DNA results stored in it, and when yours and hers were compared, the DNA matched perfectly. This finding completely confirmed his conjecture. He lowered his gaze on her. I've long known that you were Elizabeth's daughter. So you already knew of it? She smiled bitterly her eyes drooping slightly, and said slowly, Gracia stole my jade back then due to a mix-up, assumed my identity, and got acknowledged by the Lewis family. Sadly, I've only figured it out just recently. From the moment she stepped into the house, I already thought that she's very suspicious. She asked in shock. Why didn't you say a thing then? Is it important? He questioned her back. Who was Gracia in his life? As such, whether her identity was real or fake did not matter to him. Why is it important? Huh. She laughed bitterly. If fate hadn't played such a cruel joke on me back then, I would have been your fiancé right from the start. They would not have met so late and in such an unsavory manner. She would have her proper identity as his fiancé, and could stand proudly beside him right from their first meeting. Episode 323 Blood Bath Monica and Stefan would not have met so late and in such an unsavory manner. She would have her proper identity as his fiance and could stand proudly beside him right from their first meeting. The man smiled at this. He could not help reaching out and rubbing her silky hair. This silly woman was probably thinking that if she were the one who had been acknowledged by the Lewis family a decade and a half ago, she would have naturally become his legitimate fiancé. He thought otherwise, however. In a way, if it had not been for Gracia pretending to be her, he might not have fallen in love with her. At that time... Being opposed to this woman's mother, it would have resented her. The young Ham would have treated her with strong hostility. Elizabeth had caused his father to be lost in ravery and his mother to harbor hate for all eternity. As the woman who was truly in his heart, Richard poured almost a lifetime's worth of love on her. His heart, which was entirely on Elizabeth, 
had never once thumped for another. The infatuated and devoted Patricia Thompson initially raged out of humiliation, only for it to lead into disappointment. It was all because of that woman. In Stefan's young mind, Elizabeth was indubitably a heinous woman. She had effortlessly destroyed his parents' marriage. She was the culprit for his family's destruction. Hence, when Peter Lewis paired him with the nine-year-old Gracia and told him that she was Elizabeth's daughter and his sister, as well as his future fiancé, the young him looked at her with disgust. He found her to be revolting. Still, with the Lewis family's inheritance rights at stake, he did not hesitate to make use of her. Getting engaged with her was for the sole purpose of gaining a bargaining chip in the fight for control of Makewell's financial group. It was not until he was older that he understood everything. What his parents had was just a marriage of convenience. It was all for the sake of winning the bout for power among the rich. This marriage had neither romance nor love. Both parties were forced into it. The marriage was merely nominal. Elizabeth was also not a third party. On the contrary, she had all along been a clean woman. His father's infatuation for her had never borne fruit. Only then did he erase his hatred for her. However, if the one Peter Lewis had brought home a decade and a half ago was Monica, he would probably not have developed romantic feelings for her, and she would have ended up being exploited by him. Gracia, who had replaced her to be a part of the Lewis family, ironically came a pawn in his fight for leadership. Simply put, that woman had replaced her as a sacrificial lamb. Fate seemed to have its providence. Their encounter was neither too early nor too late and was just right. Sometimes an unexpected turn of events might not actually be a mistake at all. It was just that, in order to meet her, he seemed to have exhausted a lifetime of luck. Seven years ago, Gracia was diagnosed to be congenitally infertile. Probably know of this matter, he said slowly. Monica nodded. Yes, I know about it. He lowered his gaze. She's actually not congenitally infertile. Her eyes on him widened in shock and incredulity. How can that be? Didn't the Lewis family bring in the country's most advanced medical center for this matter? Makewell Financial Group holds 40% of the country's medical market share. His lips arched. As such, it's not really difficult for me to falsify a simple medical record. She was so shocked. She was rendered speechless. Um, what do you mean? Monica did not fully understand it. She, all along, found Gracia's pregnancy to be suspicious. It was very strange, no matter what angle one looked at it. Seven years ago, that woman had burst into the room and condescendingly threatened her. If it were not for her infertility, there would be no chance for her surrogacy at all. That was when she had become privy to the fiancé of the employer, whom she had signed a contract with, being infertile. How could someone who had been diagnosed by various medical authorities suddenly become pregnant? It was extremely bizarre and practically unheard of. Even though miracles did happen, Gracia's case was just too strange. Noting her constantly changing expressions, he slowly explained, I got someone to falsify her so-called infertility diagnosis. He had someone falsify that woman's medical report? Indeed, this man was extremely powerful. In the capital, with the Lewis family's power and influence, this man was a character that could shift one's ground and bring people horror with a lift of his hand. Falsifying a medical diagnosis was nothing more than a small act to him. However, Why did you do that? She asked with alarm and perplexity. The corner of his eyes raised slightly. 
and cold light shot forth from the depths of his orbs as he calmly answered, She's a pawn. A pawn must obey the will of its master. This is the duty that she should fulfill in her given role. She was stunned. Still, after careful deliberation, her surprise abated. It did not feel strange anymore to hear such ruthless and indifferent words from his mouth. She remained confused, though. Pawn? What pawn? At that time, Grandpa ordered me to be engaged with her, he sneeringly explained, in exchange for the inheritance rights to the Lewis family's head seat. With the size of the Lewis clan, not everyone was eligible to step foot into its main residence. Only the Lewis family's head and its progeny were entitled to live in the main residence. At the passing of his father, he and his mother threaded on thin ice in this huge family while relying on each other. The internal of the clan rose and fell, and there were many Lewis family factions. Be it the direct descendants or the collateral branches, many were covetously eyeing his position. He, as Peter Lewis's lofty grandson, was the most viable heir to the seat of the Lewis family's leader. Therefore, he was a thorn in those people's flesh, and many wanted to uproot him from the main branch and usurp his eligibility to inherit the highest position in the family. He lived in fear every day and every moment. As such, back then, the Lewis family's inheritance was indubitably a talisman for him and his mother. At that time, Grandpa was old, and his body was getting worse. Ever since my father's passing, the position as the Lewis family's head has been kept empty. Many people were eyeing it, and Grandpa was hesitant to name the next head. With a blank face, he continued to recount, I, as the most viable inheritor for the position that many were coveting, was not old enough. To secure my succession, I used marriage as a bargaining chip, and Gracia thus became a pawn for me to exploit. Do you think I'll develop any romantic feelings for a pawn? Chill settled in her heart. Man, he was absolutely evil to the core to exploit people in such a manner. If that woman ever found out that her infertility was for this man's benefit, how would she feel at having been reduced into a tactical piece to this game of chess? She would most likely go crazy. Episode 324 The Little Liar of Duplicity It turned out that Gracia was pathetic after all. She was deeply in love with this man, whom she took as her beloved, yet what she did not know was that, at the end of the day, she was no more than a pawn in his political game. She was a pathetic and sorrowful figure, but not worthy of pity at all. She got her just desserts in the end. While Monica was astounded by what she had heard, she also wondered to herself what would have been her fate if she had been the one to return to Lewis' family a decade and a half ago. If it were not for this incredible twist of fate, would she be the pawn instead? Then, now that she's pregnant, whose child can that be? She carefully probed. He glanced at her from his periphery and casually remarked, That's not mine. Who can that be, then? Mark, my accompanying assistant. I believe that you haven't seen him before. She recounted the past events in her mind, and quickly realized that she might have seen that person before. She remembered that when she bumped into Gracia inside that restaurant's washroom before, there was also a man present whose behavior toward the latter was ambiguous. Although that woman tried to distance herself from him, the man's mannerism and his expression when he looked at her gave away their intimate relationship. How close were they? No one knew. I saw that man once. He looked clean-cut and respectable. 
I think he's that Mark you're talking about. When was that? A few days ago, at a restaurant. You saw them? Uh-huh. What did she say to you? Her face sank. She told me that she has your flesh and blood. He playfully fingered her palm and then looked up to give her a teasing glance. So you got jealous? It was not a question, but a statement. Because she was jealous. She blacklisted his number. No, she denied vehemently. He did not believe that, apparently. His eyes brimming with a teasing smile, he said, Little liar. You're obviously jealous. No. All right, you're not jealous, then. He smiled dotingly at her knowing full well not to wrangle with this little fool who was as proud as a peacock and duplicitous when it came to love. He did not expect her to be this proud, but he liked it. In fact, he liked every inch of her. She stared at his handsome face and broke into a chuckle suddenly. Her face could hardly contain her smile. What are you laughing about? He frowned quizzically. Well... Who would have thought that her great master, Lewis, would be cuckolded? She teased him mercilessly. His face turned sullen out of the blue, while his eyes flashed darkly and coldly. That doesn't count. Uh. He straightened up all of a sudden, grabbed her two wrists, and pulled her to his chest. She took a tumble right into his embrace, sans a warning. Lifting her chin to look into her eyes, he emphasized... My woman is you, and not her. She let out a gasp as her eyes turned wide. So, I'm not considered as cuckolded? I'm only kidding. Must you take it so seriously? She let out a chuckle with her hand covering her lips. Stefan, sometimes you're just like a child. No. He looked down and hugged her close to his chest. Leaning over, he lowered his head and suckled lightly on her fingertips, for he told her in one breathing, I'm your man. Her face blushed as she sipped her lips. I'm your man, so I'll protect you. This was his responsibility as her man. Monica looked at him. Her pearly white teeth gently bit on her lower lip, which left a faint indented line along the pinkish flap. She was deeply moved by his words. Stefan, were you trying to protect me when you didn't bring me back to the Lewis family? Oh, why do you ask? It's an intuitive guess. She continued, smilingly. I have a feeling that the Lewis family is like the tiger's den. There's no warmth in there. The family that I want isn't like that. I won't let you step into a terrifying place such as the Lewis household. He stroked her fair and flawless face and could not help giving a peck on her eyelashes. I'll protect you and Andre as well. Haley was sent to the hospital by her friends. The doctor treated her open wound, which Scab had formed by then, and applied the antiseptic medication before bandaging it finally. This was not considered as a serious injury by most people. However, for Haley, who had never been hurt before, she deemed this to be the most serious. Along the way to the hospital, her heart was in pain from Monica's punishing words. Nadia and Logan saw her return home and wanted to call out to her for some desserts when they noticed her depressed look and limping gait. Both looked at each other in great alarm. Her mother was especially heartbroken and quickly went up to her. Haley, what happened to you? Her mother also anxiously came over to have a look, hugging her shoulders at the same time. The woman remained quiet. He looked down and swept his gaze over her sorry state, with a bandaged knee and varying degrees of abrasions all over her body. Haley, what actually happened to you? He inquired anxiously. Why are you covered in bruises? <laughs> Brother! Her nose turned red. Unable to contain her depression anymore, 
She plunged headlong into her brother's arms. Haley, what happened to you? Why do you look like this? Actually, you can speak about it to Mother. Her mother quipped anxiously at the side. Curled up inside her brother's arms, the woman bawled her eyes out without speaking. He was heartbroken and helpless when it came to this precious sister this time. Haley was the apple of her family's eye and their proud princess. Without a clue on what to do next, Nadia could only watch with heart-wrenching pain the sad and sorry state of her as the latter cried her heart out in her brother's arms. This daughter of hers used to stick to her when she was much younger. For some reason, she began to distance herself from her when she hit puberty. She hardly confided to her about her personal life anymore. Some things were inconvenient to speak to her mother, now that she was all grown up after all. Haley, thus, started to hide things from her mother. In contrast, she was very close to her brother and would tell him everything. After all, he, who was the oldest among the three siblings, really doted on his two younger sisters. She trusted and depended on him very much. Knowing that, their mother signaled him with her eyes, which the latter quickly caught on. He lowered his head and urged his sister, Haley, tell me what happened, and your brother here will help you, all right? The woman slowly nodded and chokingly divulged, My brother, my heart is so painful that I can hardly breathe. Every provocative word of Monica rang ceaselessly in her head. I'm different from you, though. I'm with him, and even have a child with him. What about you? انضموا إلى مؤتمر القمة العالمي للابتكار في الرعاية الصحية وش حيث نبحث عن حلول مبتكرة لأكبر التحديات في الرعاية الصحية منذ عام 2012 وليتز نظر إلى الصحة من منظور إنساني لتعزيز المساواة والمرونة أكثر من 200 مشارك ومبتكر يشاركون رؤاهم عبر أربعة مسارات رئيسية تناقش مجموعة من أكبر التحديات الصحية التي تواجه العالم اليوم انضموا الينا بالدوحة في نوفمبر القادم واسلموا في صناعة مستقبل اكثر صحة. Episode 325 You're only his crutch. Haley refused to believe it. Refused to believe that Monica was her brother Stefan's beloved woman. All the more, she refused to believe that Sam was their love child. However, evidence spoke louder than persuasion. Monica did not seem to be lying. For the most part, after closely observing that woman's features, they did seem similar to Sam's. Could all of these be true? In earlier years, Rumors of Gracia's infertility floated around, and the Lewis family was offering an astronomical sum for a surrogacy contract. Sam, that child, was born from a hired surrogate and not Gracia. Could Monica be that mysterious surrogate mother? Logan escorted his sister into her room and her bed. She finally managed to calm down after his soothing consolation. Haley relied on her brother more than anyone else. Only he could truly embrace her reasonable tantrums. She relied on her brother to the extent that she was only willing to share her problems to him. Brother, tell me, is it possible between Brother Lewis and I? She clasped her hands together firmly and cautiously probed. However, he flew into a rage and sprang up to his feet with an immensely dark face. I knew it! It's really him! Who else could make you lose your mind like this? He paced back and forth before he suddenly bent down before her 
and tightly grasped her shoulders. My silly sister, do you really like that man that much? I've already told you many times that it's impossible between you two, so you should give up on him, he rebuked solemnly. I've liked him for over a decade now. Asking me to give up with mere words, brother? I simply can't do that, she indignantly declared with puckered lips. You're related to him by blood. No one knows it better than you whether you two can be together or not. He slammed his fist on the table in agitation. His younger sister loved sticking with Stefan from a young age. When she was younger... She would follow him and address the man as uncle. However, as her teenage years passed, she felt that calling him uncle was a constant reminder of their kinship. She then started addressing him as brother instead to delude herself of their relationship. She was doing this as if it could make their distance closer. No one knew what was going on in this lass's head. As if she were out of her mind, she obsessively thought of Brother Lewis night and day. She had fallen for his charms. Ruffling his hair in frustration, he frowned at her in exasperation. She was taken aback by his livid expression, yet she stubbornly insisted, What of us being related by blood? I just like Brother Lewis and want to marry him. Nonsense. You're simply spouting nonsense. He stood on his feet and flared up completely. Haley, both of us should call him uncle. You are his niece. Forget your refusal to address him as Uncle Lewis. You even declared your desire to be together with him. Do you know that that is immoral? If words of you doing this were to get out, the Pierce family would only be disgraced. You'd humiliate me, Dad, and Mom. She could not be reconciled, though, and contended... Many others are in incestuous relationships without repercussions to their offspring. That's not considered as immoral, right? What are you doing by deceiving yourself? Thoroughly enraged, he could not stop himself from reaching his hand out to poke her forehead. Use your head to think. If you were to be married with your uncle, what would others think of you? I don't care, she asserted. Anyway... I just like him. It's unimportant how others think of me or view me. You. He pointed a finger to his sister, at a loss for words from his rage. She stared stubbornly at him and pursed her lips in utmost obstinacy. As he looked into her glistening eyes, his heart was ultimately softened. Do not talk about this anymore. There's no point in me saying anything. You'll figure it out sooner or later. He could only comfort himself by hoping that one day his sister would give up on Stefan. Even among the rich, consanguineous marriage was common. However, with the Pierce family coming from a long line of gentle folks, they seized political power through the barrel of a gun, in particular during old Pierce's generation as one of the ten founding fathers of this country. He was a man with notable achievements. He held great status and sway in the capital. Even the Lewises had to pay the Pierces some respect because of him. Therefore, if the Piers, following their stringent customs, were to know of this matter, his sister would probably be exiled from the family by old Piers out of anger. Naturally, he could not just be a bystander as his younger sister walked on the wrong path. I don't understand. I really don't get it. I thought that Brother Lewis loves me the most. I thought that he likes me too. She did not come around to the idea at all. She was, all along, the person Stefan cared about the most. Even if the person was his fiance Gracia, he never showed much care for. In her eyes, the man treated everyone indifferently and only doted on her dearly. She thought that there was a special place for her in his heart. However, what had happened tonight dealt a heavy blow to her. He doted on you for a reason. Don't you know that? He simply thought that she was beyond help. What reason? 
You look similar to Great Aunt Jiang. He set himself in front of her and carefully analyzed her feature. On camera, you both look the same. When Great Aunt passed away, no one could step closer to Uncle Lewis except for you, simply because your face provided him with much relief. Your similar looks to his mother are precisely why he showers you with love, all for the purpose of easing his longing for her. Simply put, you're just his mother's replacement. Do you understand? They look like Great Aunt? Her fingers hovered over her face in disbelief. She thought that her brother's words were a little uncalled for. He was rather surprised by her confusion. Hasn't Uncle Lewis told you this before? He had heard this from their mother. His sister and great aunt looked extremely alike. When his mother passed away, Stefan locked himself in his room and refused to step out. He even lost his desire for food and drinks. The affection he had for his mother far exceeded anyone else in the Lewis family. His beloved kin, departing from Earth, dealt him a heavy blow. Back then, Nadia brought his sister Haley along to the Lewis residence to attend their great aunt's funeral. The young Stefan then stared at her for the longest time. Tears trickled down his expressionless face as he held her tightly in his embrace. He then showered her with love, equivalent to his deep yearning for his mother. She was certainly his spiritual sustenance. He assumed that she was aware of this. Shaking her head in despondence, she replied, I don't know. Brother Lewis has never mentioned anything about great aunt to me before. Episode 326 I Will Get Even With Him For You Logan sighed in frustration. That's because Great Aunt is his deepest pain, so he hardly talks about her. After a prolonged silence, Haley popped a question. Brother, do you have any photos of her? What are you going to do with it? I'm curious. I've never seen her before. Hearing you say all that makes me want to check how alike we are and look. She replied with certainty. He then went to get an album with the requested photo. It was the only photograph of the Thompson sisters, Nadia and Patricia. At one glance, Haley noticed her similar facial features to Patricia's. If this photo were to be shown to others, they would all mistake her as Great Aunt's daughter. She was entranced by the photo. Did this mean that from the very start... Her uncle only doted on her because she owned a face akin to her great aunt. As she gazed at the photo, she reflexively touched her cheeks. Suddenly, a strange and profound smile emerged on her lips. She and great aunt looked alike. Could this also mean that at the very least, he would not hate her? Did she still have a chance then? Monica was simply a nobody. He might pamper her a lot, yet she was ultimately his latest conquest. While she might delight in his affection now, there was no guarantee that he would not cast her aside eventually. As for her, Stefan would never cast her aside. She loved him. Even if this was deemed as immoral, even if she did not get a proper title to her name, she was wholly blasé about that. This faith was a bargaining chip she held tightly in her hands. She must take back Stefan from that woman's clutches. Haley puckered her lips tightly in resolve. In the past, she did not know that she was in possession of such an overwhelming advantage. What if she was just a replacement? What if she was a spiritual sustenance? Regardless of her title and methods, as long as she could stay beside her beloved, she would swallow any indignation and resort to any means. Logan was not the least bit aware of what his sister was planning. Lifting the corner of her skirt, he fixed his gaze onto the gauze soaked with blood, and his heart ached immensely. 
How exactly did you get this injury? Returning to her senses, the spider brother's fraught face with concern and promptly feigned indignation. Brother, someone bullied me. At her complaint, he was instantly enraged. Who bullied you? Monica Thames. That woman hit me. What? Instantly springing to his feet in shock, flare of fury glinted in his handsome eyes. Who is Monica Thames? How dared she bully you? <laughs> While sobbing, Haley repeated to him everything that had happened earlier today. He was utterly infuriated this time. His dear sister, whom he was usually reluctant to lay a hand on, was bullied outside and even returned with injuries all over her body. How could he tolerate this? He clenched his fist tightly in fury and said through gritted teeth, That woman is called Monica Thames, right? Brother, don't get mad. She seems to be Stefan's woman. Although she is rather arrogant, she's still doted on by him. Surely she knows no fear. Don't stand up for me. What if Brother Lewis takes offense? She's a woman. The Lewis may have influence and power, but in the capital, they must still give the Pierce family some face. I don't believe that he'll dare offend us for a lowly woman. Haley, don't get upset anymore. I'll get even with him for you. She tugged him in delight. Oh, brother, you're the best. It was getting late into the night. Stefan brought Monica back home. She had barely recovered from the earlier indulgence and pleasant experience on their way there. Before this, he led her into a helicopter, and they flew around the island once. This was her first time in a helicopter, and it was truly novel and interesting. From a vantage point in the air, she overlooked the island this night. The entire island was decorated with starlight. Colorful specks of light were reflected on the lake's surface, dyeing it in a beautiful hue. At a glance, the landscape of the island was absolutely breathtaking. Although she was feeling rather nervous riding a helicopter for the first time, when she looked down to the island, she was completely subdued by its natural beauty. It was no wonder having a date with their other halves at Bali restaurant was said to be a dream come true for most girls. Every detail was so romantic, she seemed to have stepped into a world of fantasy. As the night breeze swept by, the island appeared to be enclosed within a sea of stars. Surprise did not stop there, as she had imagined. When she stepped out of the helicopter, she was instantly surrounded by fireworks. More than 10,000 roses carpeted the floor. She could not help but fall into an illusion of being in a bed of flowers. In the past, when she was still a student, she often spotted the act of gifting roses between couples. A man gifted the woman one stalk, two stalks, and even a car of roses delivered to delight her. Back then, she thought it was tacky for a man to give a woman roses and vice versa. Is there not another way to convey feelings? However, looking at this carpet of roses, which was akin to tapestries, accompanied by dazzling fireworks, which cast a dreamy thread of colors, she was so surprised her breath was taken away. She did not know that a sea of roses could be this beautiful. It was so beautiful that she could not recover from the surprise for a long time. Tonight's date had fulfilled all the expectations she had for a date. The man glanced at her in the passenger seat from his periphery. He could not help but break into a smile as he saw her hover her hand over her heart and stare into space. What are you thinking about? Stefan, do you know, I previously thought that it is tasteless to gift roses. She turned to look at him with shocked eyes. But I finally understand why girls like roses tonight. This was not just any surprise or emotion. 
This was a tear-jerking emotion, an emotion that made her feel loved. Girls did desire for romance in their bones. Even Stefan thought that gifting roses to women were something very tasteless in the past. However, since this was something that Monica liked, Stefan did not mind doing it at all. He was initially planning on staying by her side for a night, yet she insisted on heading home to accompany Andres. Earlier, when she informed her son that she was required to shoot some scenes and could not make it home for a few more nights, her heart ached at the disappointed expression he put. As such, she wanted to hurry home to be with him. The vehicle halted at the entrance to the villa. She hopped out of the vehicle and was astounded to see the lights in the study room still on. She lifted her wrist to check the time intuitively. It was already one in the morning. What exactly was that child doing? Was he still awake? The man stepped out of the car and was rather surprised to see the lights on as well. They stared at each other in consternation. Inside the study room, Andre sat before his laptop with tightly knitted brows and stern face. His fingers occasionally flew across the keyboard as he punched several keys to enter a string of commands on the application window. Rows of code directives progressively appeared on a black interface. He stared at it rapidly, sans an expression. His attention was completely drawn to it that he did not hear the door to the study room opening despite his acute senses. Episode 327 The Little Lad's Secret Andre stared at it rapidly, sans an expression. His attention was completely drawn to it that he did not hear the door to the study room opening despite his acute senses. A stifling low pressure filled the entire room. He fixed his eyes on the laptop screen and seriously browsed through the data displayed. Sternness took hold of his rosy, yet taut features, and fierceness shone from his frigid eyes. Shortly after this, all the figures on the screen turned red. He slightly pursed his pink lips, as if to indicate that his victory was within reach. The fingers danced around the keyboard a few more times, and characters constantly appeared on the screen. Clack, clack, clack. The tapping on the keyboard seemed endless. Nothing else could be heard other than it. He held his breath, deep concentration. His eyes flared up as they hinted of mockery in that instant. The data soon seemed to explode into unrecognizable codes, and the screen flickered to display the Pentagon's main webpage as protection system crashing. Tornado Group's iconic emblem suddenly appeared on the webpage and Andres' tout features receded as an elegant smile formed at once. Hm. Huh. You people think too highly of yourselves to even consider matching with me. He closed the interface and placed the keyboard aside. Slowly lifting a cup of Salem black tea, he took a sip of it gracefully. A tab of his video conference with Frederick, which was at the bottom right corner of the screen, incessantly blinked. Clicking on it, the search changed to display a frame of Frederick facing the camera with an utterly shocked look. Oh god, Andres, how are you so fierce? You crashed the firewall of the Pentagon's webpage just like that. He was astonished to witness for himself the collapse of a heavily protected firewall. The child's abilities were far greater than he had imagined. The Pentagon's firewall was tight. Still, within a few minutes, he completely destroyed it. How was he this vicious? How was he this unbelievable? How was this child so frighteningly powerful? The agent was already shocked speechless by the kid's display of his skills. Ha! Huh. A condescending smirk crept into his lips, and his eyes glinted with much derision. To me... Pentagon's so-called firewall is nothing but an empty shell. How dare they check and detain his cargo vessel? When did a puny Pentagon dare hack into his system, mobilize the staff at the port, and detain his cargo? 
This was undoubtedly a risky move for them. Whenever a new president took command of the American government, he would attempt some foolish moves. Thus, these newly ascended government officials dared provoke him. Great, just great. Since they did not follow the rules, he did not mind teaching them a lesson. This transaction was of utmost importance to him. While the northern American market was not under his jurisdiction, he was in charge of this shipping route. They dared block off his route. They were clearly asking for death. Considering that they were this bold to make such a move, they should not blame him for being vicious as well. His successful attempt at breaking the firewall had probably left the Pentagon in shackles. The latter would likely require some time to bounce back from the damage. Listening to his arrogant and insolent speech, Frederick greatly admired him from his heart. He even started to suspect if this child had undergone genovariation. Constantly comparing oneself to others could truly make one angry. He could not even fluidly type using the five-stroke input method now. In contrast, this child had already crashed the firewall of the Pentagon's website within a short time. Frederick felt slightly crazed as he lamented the unfairness of life. Andres drummed his fingers on the table. He was starting to ponder when he felt a shift in the atmosphere. On the screen, Andres abruptly went silent. He was staring directly behind him. Shivers went up the little boy's spine from seeing his rigid expression. Where are you looking at? Mommy. With mouth agape, this word left his agent's lips. Mommy? The little lad followed his line of sight to his back in doubt, only to see Monica standing there with a look of suspicion and Stefan next to her with a look of enigma. Mommy! With the two creeping up to him like apparitions, Andres was so shocked he almost lost his mind. In that moment, his heart stopped beating. He sprang up from his leather chair and stood ramrod straight in shock as his hand reflexively reached out to switch off his laptop screen. His mother wore an odd look as she observed his actions, which were carried out with a guilty conscience. As for Stefan, a calm yet deep smile slowly formed in his eyes. The boy was trembling in fear under her doubting gaze. Mommy, why did she come back at this time? Had she not said that she would be staying at the set to film and could not make it back home tonight? He counted the days. She should only be back the day after tomorrow at the earliest. Why was she now... Also, when did the two enter his study room? They appeared behind his back like ghosts and uttered not a word. Andres tapped his chest. He was frightened. Why did they appear in such a horrifying manner? Creeping to a person without a sound would really frighten them to death. He did not know when they entered, so he wondered how much of his talk with the agent they had heard. The boy shifted his side onto Stefan again. He was puzzled and astonished. Why was this man here? Mommy! Why did you come home at this time? He withdrew his previous kingly aura and morphed himself into an adorable fairy in an instant. He stretched his hand out to tug at her shirt's hemline affectionately. She scrutinized the play of emotions on his face and all of a sudden questioned him with uncertainty. Darling, what were you actually doing moments ago? Feeling slightly nervous, he pretended to be ignorant and replied, I... I wasn't doing anything. He cautiously stole a glance at the man, yet he met with a look in return, which seemed to indicate, I know what you're doing. He shuddered. His mommy did not know of things that required a deeper understanding. Thus, she could not comprehend his moves just yet. The man was different, though. Even if he could not figure out what was displayed, he should be able to grasp the meaning of his words. The little lad was a little worried. Earlier, the situation was so nerve-wracking and intense that he could not spare some energy to keep watch of his surroundings. Hence, 
He did not notice when they opened the door and entered the study room. He did not even catch the sound of their footsteps. Really? Scrutinizing his guilt-ridden face, she was rather doubtful of her son's claim. I just heard you say something along the line of seeking their death. Her son was her lovely, caring little deity. How was it possible for him to spout such vicious words? He instantly suffered from a brain crash. After careful deliberation, he rushed to explain, No! Mommy, don't let your thoughts run wild. Andre is just playing a game. What game? Red Alert, he clarified. It's a strategy game. You also said something about the Pentagon? This game is supposed to be played like that. One wins after conquering the Pentagon. He cleared it up as he broke into cold sweat. He kept observing the man's expression. Mommy might not comprehend. This man surely could. Episode 328 Let Me Hear You Call Me Daddy Stefan cast Andres an indifferent look. Obviously, he knew what mischief Andres was up to again. This son of his was more capable than he had thought. He could actually breach the Pentagon's security system with minimal effort. His son was truly a chip off the old block. The father and son exchanged glances and remained reticent. Monica was still skeptical. Really? Really, really. Mommy, Andres is really playing a game. He pouted his lip, as if he were being wronged, and made an affectionate move on her with his innocuous eyes. She was ultimately defeated by him, but she could not refrain from lecturing him. He must take note of the time. Even when you're playing a game next time, it's already so late. Didn't I tell you to maintain a regular sleeping schedule? Do you always misbehave once mommy is not at home? Hearing her nag, a heavy weight was lifted off his heart instead. It seemed that his mommy believed him. He quickly schooled his face into a pitiful one. Sorry, mommy. I'm at fault. This isn't intentional. It's just that... I took a longer time playing this round. Andres won't do this next time. There won't be a next time, she rebuked. Right away, Andres bobbed his head in a motion akin to pounding garlic, and then cajoled. Mommy, Andres is hungry. Can Mommy go cook some noodles for Andres? As these cooing words left his lips, he pulled at her clothes while gazing at her miserably. I simply can't do anything about you, can I? Monica's heart had softened by now. I'll go cook some noodles for you. Quickly clean up the study room and go to sleep after you eat. Okay. Her son cheered straight away and clapped his hands in delight. She helplessly reached her hand out to stroke his head before she left the room to prepare the noodles. The father and son, who remained in the same space, stared at each other. The warmth and adoration found across his features departed in a flash. He cast his frosty eyes on the man and interrogated him in an unwelcoming manner. Stefan, what are you doing here? Stefan dipped his head to look at him and could not help but snarl. You ungrateful brat. Andres furrowed his brows, unable to catch his words. Plastering the sinister smirk on his lip, he bent down to his son's level. When you deceived your mommy with a lie moments ago, I didn't expose you out of goodwill. Once your mommy left, you then treat me in such a manner? I didn't lie. I was just playing a game. The little lad threw up his hands with an innocent face. Breaching the security system of the Pentagon was indeed a simple and low-level game to him. It was not a challenge, even. He did not lie. 
He had never lied to his mommy. He was a well-behaved child. He owned a clear conscience. You were playing a game. The man nodded sincerely. It was just that this game could not be completed by just any adult skilled at hacking. Breaching the Pentagon within minutes. I'm truly regarding you in a different light now. The man looked intensely at him. Do you play with firearms too? The boy's complexion darkened at once. This man was far smarter than he had imagined. He actually recognized what was on the screen previously. You... The Northern American and East Asian routes are under your administration, huh? The little lad was left entirely speechless. His daddy was a formidable character indeed. The man sighed helplessly. Your mommy is dumb. She can't understand these. But I do, of course. My mommy isn't dumb. The child glared at him fiercely upon hearing his words. He grunted and retorted. You're not allowed to speak ill of my mommy. Fine. The man readily consented to his will. Let me hear you call me daddy for once, then. The man looked at him with a playful smirk on his lips. Something changed in the boy's eyes, and a layer of frost swiftly spread across his features. Did this man just tell him to address him as daddy? Disdain and despise flowed from his orbs. Are you asking me to call you daddy? Dream on! Andres haughtily folded his arms as he puckered his lips and raised his head. Childishness was present between his brows. This man was simply dreaming. Letting him call him daddy. His mommy had yet to marry this man, yet he already wanted him to address him differently. Was this possible? He cocked a brow and exclaimed, Stubborn child, you really refuse to call me daddy? You wish. The little lad spat this rejection with total disregard of his feeling, not giving him any allowance to argue. His son's lips jerked to form a cold smirk, seemed to be steadfast and not respecting him. He shook his head helplessly and appeared to be very frustrated. Then I can only report your situation to your mommy. Situation? What situation? The boy narrowed his eyes in alert, sizing up the man, his brows knitted in perplexity. What do you mean? The adult let him into the conversation. Little thing, take a guess of what can happen if your mommy learns that you have a major part at Lego Holdings. The little lad's handsome brows creased. He thought it over carefully, then quickly realized something. He then gazed at the man coldly from his periphery, and snorted questioningly, Are you threatening me? He nodded, admitting it openly. The corner of the boy's eyes violently twitched. He then mocked the man. Stefan, do you dare act more shameless? A certain man seriously and boldly bobbed his head down. Yes, I do. Do you want me to try? The little lad was dumbfounded. This man was truly shameless, even more so than he imagined. Andres, however, did not buy his threat, and only smirked. Huh. Stefan, do you really think that you can use that to threaten me? Sooner or later, I will confess my identity to my mommy. It's only a matter of time. You can't threaten me like this. Oh, really? Looking at him from the corner of his eye, he dragged the last syllable for a much longer time. The little lad raised his head upon hearing him speak like that, just in time to catch sight of the fleeting slyness in his eyes. His heart suddenly quaked. He actually felt a little guilty after seeing the smile in his orbs. With a grin tugging at the corner of his eyes, his handsome face slowly inched closer to the little lad. He broke out into a sinister grin as words left his thin lips at once. Take a guess now. What may happen if your mommy finds out that you're dealing with firearms, hacking, smuggling, and toying with petroleum? Every word he spouted 
had the young kid's heart palpitating with anxiety and fear. The lad gawked at the man in disbelief. That sly yet mischievous smirk on his face felt so unpleasant to his eyes in this very moment. Andres was at a complete loss for words. Ma'am, how much information does he actually have on me? How does he know? Andres cast a skeptical and cautious gaze on him. He had obviously hidden his identity well. How exactly did this man know of it? Do you want to ask me how I know about this? The man seemed capable of reading his mind. The little lad pressed his lips tightly together, yet said nothing. The man reached out his hand to pinch the youngster's puffy cheeks teasingly. A profound upward curve grew on his face before he deliberately poked fun of the little lad to annoy him. I'm not telling you. The boy gritted his teeth. This man was too much. Episode 329 Father and Son's Black Bellied Contest. This man is a sadist. The boy, who was truly angered by his unscrupulous look, could not do anything about it. Stroking his chin, the adult probed curiously. When did you start tinkering with firearms? Why should I answer your question? Probably started in May last year when you officially joined the Tornado Group. Am I correct? Stefan blinked at Andres. The boy was dumbstruck again. This man was a thorough sadist to ask him a question, which he already knew the answer. I just want to see how truthful you are with your daddy. The man could somehow tell what he was thinking, and clarified this to him. The look on the boy's face turned for the worse at his words. Can this man do mind reading? Can you tell what is on my mind with just a look? The little lad searched the man's features for any tactics. And to this, the man only lazily replied, Don't bother. I don't do mind reading. The tips of his mouth twitched a little. Shit. No. He did not get mad or swear. That would make him a goner if he got caught in action by his mommy. Be gentlemanly and gracious. Be gentlemanly and gracious. He tried to brainwash himself by repeating that in his mind. Once he finally calmed himself down, Andres presented an elegant smile. Stefan, you seem to know a lot. Oh. I also know that you are the general director of the East Asian arms market. The boy could not help faltering a step behind in order to keep a safe distance from him. He reckoned this man to be ignorant of his identity at first. Now, he realized that he had totally underestimated this man. Unscrupulous to the extreme. Poor Andres did not even pause to consider the hereditary genes he had received from his father, which accounted for his propensity to commit black belly deeds. As such, how could this man be that simple in the first place? If the son was so exceptional... His father would naturally be someone outstanding, too. The man saw the guarded look on his face and smilingly continued speaking. I also know that you are the arsenal designer for the Tornado Group. You! Where did you get this intel of me from? Oh, I've been to your study room. He smiled evilly. There are a number of design crafts in your hard drive. Besides that... You also have that quantum computing research technology. The little lad panicked. You broke through my firewall? Yes, I did, he replied succinctly. That day, before he flew off to England, and just before this boy's mother reached home, he took the liberty to tour around his study room. There were many hand-drawn sketches hidden below his study table. At first, he thought that they were drawings of Lego's new machineries. After studying them carefully, he was shocked to discover that they were drawings for building missiles. When he powered on the computer, he managed to decode the three layers of firewall set up by the little lad, but his momentum was stopped at the fourth level of security despite his best efforts. He reckoned that this supreme system 
had about nine levels of firewall in place. Alas, he could only take down the first three layers with his ability. He would never tell his son about that, though. That would just be utterly humiliating. Indeed, it was humiliating to admit that this brilliant father could not decode the security system set up by his son. However, the boy did not know that, and took a good hard look at his father. Thinking that his old man broke through the nine levels of defense he had set up in place, he could not help seeing him in a whole new light. How dare you read my top-level secret files! At this, his father merely smiled. Well, that's what happens when your security system isn't robust enough. What else do you know? Andres' eyes were on red alert. The man crinkled the corner of his eyes enticingly and answered with a sidelong glance. Isn't this enough? Arms smuggling with crude oil monopoly. These are serious crimes indeed. I didn't expect my son to be the ringleader of a military and arms group. What a scare. He mockingly patted his chest in an exaggerated display of fear. The boy was thoroughly floored. What an actor. He was apparently looking calm and cool right now. Despicable. This man is too evil. He was more unscrupulous than he had imagined him to be. The man looked solemnly at him before asking, Tell me, do you think that your mommy won't be horrified and suffering a myocardial infarction if she finds out that you're the leader of a firearms group at such a young age? The boy only smiled defiantly at him with a look of disdain. Even if you are to go to her, my mommy will trust my words only, and not yours. After all, I'm the cutest and most gentlemanly boy of hers. What if I hold proof? The man asked in return. That stunned the boy for good. What? I hold proof of your secret deeds. I'm sure your mommy will be very surprised when she gets a hold of it. The wicked smile of his father's face was especially glaring. The boy could only clench his teeth in deep frustration as he cursed inwardly at this fiendish man. If possible, he really wanted to tear apart this black-bellied man's smiling face. Your mommy is like a pure little rabbit. If she learns of her son being the leader of a firearms group, she'll surely be horrified, right? The boy cut in. How much do you know exactly? The man shrugged his shoulders innocently, as if he did not know anything at all. Andres could tell that his father had grasped everything about him, including his secret. Although he was really reluctant to compromise, he knew that this was the only way out for now. Frowning deeply with a pout, he asked, What's your condition to keep this a secret? Let me hear you call me Daddy. The man lifted his chin arrogantly. The topic was thus, back to square one. The boy's face was feeling red. He looked as if he would go up in smoke at any moment. How shameful. Alas, if he did not abide by his condition, the man might just tell his mother his secret deeds. If his mommy knew that he was meddling with firearms and crude oil, she might really suffer a myocardial infarction. She might even move to destroy him. He did not want to imagine what terrible situation it would result. He was always careful to hide the matter, and thought that this man would be unable to dig out the truth. Regrettably, he had sorely underestimated this man. With a sidelong glare, the boy turned his back to the man and tried to squeeze out the word through his clenched teeth as he held the table's edge to support with vice-like grip. Daddy! His scornful look was full of humiliation. The word was soft, like the buzzing of a mosquito, and could hardly be heard. Calling out this term was the most he could bear for now. The man was obviously unsatisfied, and said cruelly, I didn't hear it. Andres turned around furiously, and told him accusingly, You did hear me! I didn't hear it, really. I swear. His father solemnly lifted his palm with his fingers, pointing to the sky. 
that antagonized the boy greatly. Stefan, do you believe that I can bomb the Lewis Group's headquarters? The man simply replied. Son, you are too aggressive. I'm going to tell your mom. You only know how to complain. The little lad was maddened. So what can you do with me? He saw the little face was ruddy with anger, yet still looked so tender and adorable and could not help giving his cheeks a pinch. Andres coldly shunned his action and gave him a disgusted look. Episode 330 Do I still have time for that now? Call me Daddy again. Daddy! It's too soft. The little boy clenched his fists and decided to swallow his pride. Daddy! Can you be gentler? Daddy! This was the scene witnessed by Monica when she entered the study room after preparing noodles. Andres, who was standing in defeat before the man, looked crestfallen as he called weakly, Daddy. Daddy. The voice went softer than before each time. The man was apparently enjoying the experience. She was momentarily stunned. When had this father-son pair been on good terms with each other? She cleared her throat and gave a dry cough. The little boy glanced sideways, and seeing her standing at the door, promptly straightened up. With a tender and adorable smile, he greeted, Mommy! She crossed her arms and asked acquiescently, What are you both doing? The boy blushed at this question. The man only replied neutrally, We're communicating to improve our relationship. Shameless. Who wants to communicate with you? You're clearly the only one putting up this whole show. I'm not keen to improve our relationship at all. Oh. The boy was feeling utterly humiliated. Andres refused to continue this game with his father. He stamped his feet angrily and looked expressively at his mother with his sorry face, still full eyes sparkling with wetness. He appeared as if he would burst into tears at any time. Monica, however, was completely dull to the whole situation. Having no clue whatsoever to the sudden change in her son's attitude to his hateful father, she could only think of her baby boy voluntarily calling his father Daddy repeatedly. Each time was sweeter than before, too. Am I hallucinating? Perhaps there's something more? She eyed the man suspiciously. Did you bully my precious? Her eyes shot daggers at him. He instantly raised his arms in the air as a gesture of innocence, crying fool with a pout. I'm innocent. I didn't do anything. This father-son pair had the same innocent look as both stared piteously at her. She was clearly taken aback. Looking at the two of them, each trying to outcompete the other on who was more pathetic, she somehow had a hallucination of them being a pair of rather cute puppies that were wagging tails. This description might be hardly apt, but they were just too alike. She could not help bursting into a pearly chuckle. Andres was even more aggrieved by her laughter. His face crumbled as he whined softly. Mommy? All right, the noodles are ready. With that, she turned and walked to the dining hall. The boy looked past his shoulder and glared baitfully at his daddy. Meanwhile, the man surreptitiously shot him from his lower eye rims a cunning glint. Are you satisfied now, Stefan? How dare you address me? He furrowed his brows unhappily. Be good and call me daddy. I've already done that moment before. The boy felt a need to remind the man not to take an inch for a yard. His father could not resist bursting into laughter at his forlorn expression. This little fellow was good in every sense, except that he was too proud and always acting petulant. Just a simple request to address him as daddy was like forcing a gun down his throat. It's so difficult. You did call me that. 
but I'd like to remind you that my condition is for you to address me as Daddy in this lifetime. In this lifetime? The little lad's face sank. Clenching his small fist, he snarled bitingly. Stefan, don't you think you're too much? How is that so? I am your daddy, and you are my son. Even so, you haven't carried out your responsibility. The boy spouted the truth word for word. Hearing that make his eyes cringed, and he stooped slightly to hold the boy's shoulders. Quietly facing the little lad at his eye level, he did not conceal the loving indulgence in his eyes. Slowly, he opened his mouth to utter, Is there still time for me to do that now? Do I still have time for that now? Andres was slightly startled by his sincere tone and expression. I want to spoil you, love you, and dote on you. Can I do that now? The man reached out to hold Andres' hand, a flash of his thumb's fingertip lightly pressing the back of it. The little lad's hand was soft and tender. It was just right for a seven-year-old. Skin was snowy white. Even the capillaries under the epidermis were clearly visible. The fingertips were of adorably pinkish color. It was hard to imagine how this boy's pair of small hands had created such incredible tales of magic and had just sent the Pentagon security system crushing down a few minutes ago. His son was a genius. Even at the mere age of seven, his achievements were already garnering worldwide attention. This tiny body seemed to contain an insurmountable spirit. Incredible. This was his son, whom he should feel proud. He should be comforted by the fact that he had such an exceptional genius for a son. However, now, as he held his little hand, there was a bittersweet emotion that seemed to spread outward from his heart. It was heart pain. His heart really ached for this kid. No matter what astonishing feats he had under his belt, he was still indubitably a seven-year-old child. He did not know how to make out of his childhood. When he investigated his identity and background, he also received a thick stack of the kid's medical records. From the reports, it seemed that this child had spent his first three years inside a hospital. Congenital heart defect, asthma, hyperventilation syndrome... The man pinched his hand softly, heartache overflowing in his eyes. The boy was stunned, and then slowly withdrew his little hand from the big one. I guess it may be too late by now. Frowning, the boy merely pouted. I'm already used to it. He was sufficiently mighty and strong now. He was mighty enough to protect his mommy. The wealth and power he had right now were sufficient to protect this family. Nothing is important to me now, other than my mommy. With that, he took a deep sigh and turned to leave the study room with heavy steps. The man stared penetratingly at his back before he broke into a smile. He could see that the child was craving for his hug. That day in the hospital, when he held him carefully in his arms by his little waist, the boy snuggled close to his chest like a harmless kitten, albeit just for that moment. This child was headstrong and proud. In any case, a gulf of separation marked by seven years of estrangement certainly existed between them. It seemed that it would be a tall task to gain the boy's approval and make the boy accept him as his father wholeheartedly. Inside the dining hall, Andres walloped his noodles with great satisfaction. When he saw the man appear, his face showed a complex look. She asked, Andres, how's mommy's skill this time? Excellent. The boy clapped and praised her generously. The noodles were thoroughly cooked, the food was not burnt, and there was no overly bland or salty taste. Her skills definitely improved. The truth was, the boy might be very picky with food, but when it came to his mommy's culinary skills, he surprisingly held low standards for her.
Episode 331 Lewis Group's Paralyzed Network Provided that Andres did not get poisoned by Monica's cooking, the boy liked everything his mother personally cooked. He refused nothing. She had also prepared Stefan's share. Sitting in front of the table, the man sampled her cooking. His brows wrinkled. The craftsmanship this time obviously did not appeal to his taste. Moreover, too much salt was put in the soup, so his throat felt a little parched just from tasting it. There was a clear drop in standard. What he did not know was that, that one time he tried her noodles, it was her best standards thus far. Noticing his frown, she nervously asked, What's the matter? Doesn't taste good? He put down his chopstick. Just as he opened his mouth to give a review, he keenly felt a pair of prickling eyes staring at him with a warning. He followed his feeling and saw the boy clenching his chopsticks with his thorn-like gaze on him. The warning look in the boy's eyes hinted to him that the latter would only accept five-star reviews, and all negative reviews would be rejected pronto. If you can, then you do it. If not, then don't be so pesky. It seemed that if he uttered any negative review of this bowl of noodles, the little guy would bomb the headquarters of the Lewis group out of rage in the ensuing second. It was a wholly crazy defender of his mommy. Under his son's gaze, he cleared his throat and praised her against his will. Yes, its taste isn't bad. Only then was the little lad pacified. She raised a brow in surprise. Really? It's truly delicious. The boy chimed in. My mommy has the standard of a five-star chef. The man's mouth twitched. What an exaggeration. If such standard was at the level of a five-star chef, then all the hotels under the Lewis Group's management could stop doing business. Sensing his thoughts, the little lad's frosty eyes pierced him again. He appeared to be asking, What? Did you not agree? Agreed. Stefan steeled his heart, clenched his teeth, and forced himself to polish off that bowl of noodle. On Andre's part, with his drooping lashes, be it his posture or movement, the boy exuded extreme elegance, just like a little young master. It was as if he were eating a high-class Western restaurant specialty instead of a bowl of home-cooked noodle soup. He possessed an innate aristocratic temperament. Just him eating a bowl of noodles could showcase his classiness. He was indeed no average person. Seeing the man finish every bit of the noodle soup, the heart sparked with joy. Does it truly taste awesome? Awesome. He grudgingly complimented again. He then retrieved his pocket square and carefully wiped the corner of his lips. In our house, Andres' cooking is the best. Try it next time if there's a chance. The boy cutely quipped. Andres only cooks for mommy. He sent the man a fleeting look of disdain. He seemed to say, Give up. I only cook for mommy. I won't ever cook for you kid. He was too biased. The man protested with his eyes. The boy's eyes countered that with a blank look, neither accepting nor rejecting. Protest was invalid. Both mutely clashed with each other through their eyes. She was confused by this. Alas, she could not fathom the meaning behind their eye interaction. This probably was the special telepathy between father and son. This incident irked the boy immensely, as he thought that he had suffered a great loss. He actually let this man lead him by the nose. Hence, when the man went to his company the following day, he immediately noticed the strange atmosphere within. Harry, who was breaking out in a cold sweat, hurriedly made his report to him. Chairman Lewis, the company's internal system network seems to have been hacked and paralyzed. Paralyzed? Stefan raised a brow and asked skeptically. How did the internal safety net get paralyzed? Hasn't the IT department dealt with it yet? 
This hacker is quite formidable. Our people in the IT department are still struggling to find a fix to the loophole. Loophole. He entered his office and turned on his computer, which was the network host connecting all the company's computers. No matter how capable this hacker was, his computer should be relatively safe. Alas, in the next second, he was slapped hard by reality. A program window abruptly popped up from the lit screen, and this was followed by the blaring of a loud dance music in the entire office. Town Funk? He only saw numerous fowls on the screen shaking their butts in tandem with the music, and from overhead, a few words slowly floated down. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Immediately after, a mocking laughter infuriatingly blasted. <laughs> he was livid. He leaned back slightly and rubbed his chiseled jaw. There was no need to think about whose masterpiece this was. On the screen, several proud-looking fowls continued to wave their handkerchiefs in a dance. Stupid, stupid, stupid! Monica received a call from Jean. At first, when she saw his call on the screen, a pang of guilt assailed her. Because of Stefan at that time, several equipments of the production crew was damaged. The filming team must have suffered a huge loss. It was unknown if the film director blamed her. After all, the matter arose because of her. She felt immensely guilty as a corollary. With a restless heart, she picked up the call, and the director's excited exclamation came through. Monica, you're my goddess! She was baffled. What do you mean, Director James? I don't quite understand. Don't you know? He quickly recounted what had happened over these past few days amid his quirkiness. It turned out that after the man had lost it and gone wild in the filming location, he gave the order to steal the crew of The Forbidden Love and ban the movie's production. Even the tapes of the shoot were confiscated. The crew's damaged equipment had film cuts inside that could not be exported in time. The director was extremely depressed. Forget about the damaged equipment, as they were merely a few campus scenes that could be refilmed, there was no problem in losing them. What truly made him feel dismayed was that scene in the music room that day, which was simply impeccable, exciting. He could retain that particular scene. He was willing to endure a few more punches. Unfortunately, with the filming crew banned and the tapes confiscated, he could only literally cry. Surprisingly, just last night, Stefan lifted his ban and told him that the production crew could resume shooting. As for the damaged equipment, Foxcom Entertainment would give him several new sets as compensation. It was not only that, the tape with the music room scene was also returned to him. In this way, everything went back on track. What about Monica then? Ever since he learned that she was that tyrannical man's woman, he saw her in a different light. Stefan was the crown prince of Makewell Financial Group, future head of the Lewis family, and the wielder of power that could cover the sky. In the entertainment world, which female star would not want to snag this bank roller? Episode 332 the Unmentionable Goddess With the man as her backer, be it resources or status, Monica could get everything. She just had to utter his name, Stefan Lewis, and no matter how strong others' connections were, all would serve as background. She did not do that, however. In the production team, she was a newbie. She could get preferential treatment through the man, yet she did not disclose even a peep about him. From her efforts, diligence, and strength, the crew got their satisfactory answer. Basically, she was a black horse among the newbies. The director, thus, became more certain of her character in his heart. However, after this matter, could she rejoin the production crew for the filming? He was more concerned about this issue. Hence, 
he carefully asked for the man's opinion. The latter coldly warned him, There's one thing you should keep in mind. Since I let my woman take part in your show, have some foresight at least. Kissing scenes were still not allowed to be shot. The most was a kissing discretion shot. Bad scenes? They should not even think about it. Holding hands, hugging, even if it was a film requirement, must not be overdone. This was considered as a relaxed condition. This could be described as a great blessing to the film director. Over the phone, he excitedly expressed, Thank you for your benevolence. The man added, I don't want to see a repeat of what happened that day. He immediately explained, Mr. Lewis, you've misunderstood. That's just filming, a part of the work. Everything is for the film's plot. Plot requirements. He lowered his voice by a few decibels. James, I see that your experience as a director is wasted on you. Can't you see if Martin is acting or revealing his true feelings? With that, he coldly hung up the phone. With the phone in his hand, a period of blankness overcame his brain. Eventually, he released a sigh. He could also tell that the superstar's reaction that day was not an act. He was a director, and the portrayal of pure love between a man and a woman was his specialty. He had seen many first-class actors. There was no doubt that Martin's acting was superb. However, no matter how superb the acting was, acting was still acting in the end. Any professional filmmaker could tell at a glance whether an actor was acting or revealing his true feelings. He could tell that the superstar was not acting, but showing his real emotions instead. That was his sincere emotions for Monica. Naturally, Stefan could also tell this, and that was why he was so out of control that day. James rushed to the set. Superstar was currently shooting for an advertisement. Taking advantage of the actor's break, he brought up this matter to him. The Superstar's face changed at that. Director James, you're overthinking it. I have no feelings for Monica. Is that so? The director exclaimed. I knew it. You're famous in this circle for being proud and cold. If you say you like men, it's more believable. As for you liking Monica, I really can't believe that. In some sense, the director was truly an insensitive person and believed his words easily. The artiste's eyes drooped slightly to wipe away the flash of desolation in them. The director was all but praises. You really scared me that day, though. Seriously, Martin. The acting has improved tremendously since you first stepped into the world of movies. Even I was shocked by your acting in that music classroom scene. Couldn't help but enter the play. The expression in your eyes, the emotional tension was too strong. Even if I were unfamiliar with your acting standards, I would really think that you have something for our Monica. The superstar smiled, yet it did not reach his indifferent eyes. The production crew was thus able to resume the shooting. The film director said, If it weren't for you, our production crew would cruelly be disbanded. Monica was shocked by this. Monica, the production team has started filming again. When can you return to join us? Tomorrow. She was all smiles. The next day, she was all ready to join the production team again. The creators of the entire production team were back in place. It was just that when she finally rejoined the team, a few subtle changes in the way everyone looked at her could be observed. This was especially felt from Claire and Pamela. The eyes they used to look at her were green with envy. Jealousy? She was baffled by the envy in their eyes, not having the slightest idea on what was going on. In the afternoon, Isabel rushed to join the production crew. The moment she saw her artiste, there was a subtle change in the look on her face, too. She could not bear it anymore. What's wrong with all of you? Why are you guys staring at me with this odd look? Her assistant was embarrassed. Monica, my apologies. You've misunderstood me. I was just surprised that you could still join the film with this production team. Why do you think so? Yeah. 
That's because you're now this production team's unmentionable goddess. Everyone wished to worship her as a goddess. She did not get what she meant. What was this about unmentionable goddess? Why could she not understand? Her assistant laughed. <laughs> Monica, with your ability to reign over this production team, who'd still dare to offend you? In her puzzlement, the assistant recounted the entire matter to her. It turned out that before she came in, the director assembled everyone and held a secret meeting. The meeting's topic was mostly about the restructuring of the production team, which mentioned a point. Previously in the production team, he noticed that many production assistants and assistants of their first-tier artists would more or less seek trouble with Monica. This was the case with Pamela, who used her celebrity ranking to bully newbie assistants and fellow actors. All of them had to watch out for her mood swings. Isabel, in particular, was ostracized by her a lot. She was used to set as an example for criticism. The director did not drop name to leave her some face. However, the moment he brought up this matter, production members could already guess the person's identity. They knew it very clearly. Pamela loved to ostracize newbies and bully female stars the most. To gain the most exposure, she was unscrupulous in her means. Seated in her chair, this artiste's face turned ghastly. Her face was green. The director secretly reminded them that Monica, although a newbie, was specifically scouted by him. Anyone seeking trouble with her was akin to slapping his face. In the production team, he held the highest position. Who would dare to offend him? He was widely known as Yama Scissorhands. Once, an important female starlet in his film was putting on airs with him. He cut the artiste's major role into a minor role within minutes. No one dared to offend him after that. After all, behind him was the top management of Foxcom. Once this meeting concluded, everyone was in awe of Monica, and they did not dare to bully her, and not to give her face like before. They were much more polite now. Isabel, being her assistant, was also pushed in the limelight. Previously... She was the most ostracized one in the production team. Now, who would dare to ostracize her? Monica's face stayed calm and unchanged. Inwardly, however, she was cursing Stefan. Surely, this was all his doing. In short, the production team was back on track. Episode 333 Cannot Compare to Monaco There were a lot of lost scenes, so James hurried Kevin, the video editor, to start filming again to make up for those. Today, the video editor was sorting out the tapes of the film scenes. Pamela, who happened to be passing by, went in and calmly stood behind him. She watched him sort out the tapes in hopes of seeing how she had performed on screen. She was quite confident in her performance this time. Apparently, it would not matter if she did not look. One look, and she realized that her scenes were reduced by a lot. She was shocked. She and many other supporting actors had been edited out from many scenes during the sorting. On principle, although she was not the protagonist, she was still a relatively important character in this film. The scenes she shot were not fewer than Monica's. However, once the editor sorted out these scenes, hers were a whole lot fewer. In many of the scenes that she and the newbie acted together, the screen time was all given to the latter, whereas hers was reduced. There were many important plot bridge sections that merely flashed her scene, and then everything was over. It was clearly an important part, but the screen time was given to that newbie. She estimated that the rookie screen time occupied a whole 70%. The longer she looked, the angrier she felt. Her heart twisted in anger. With no air to vent her anger, she viciously clenched her fists so hard her sharp nails dug into her palm skin. She bit her lower lip hard and then left. 
Not long after, she sent out an assistant to get her answer. The editor was almost done with his work. The sleuthing assistant presented him with cold drink to relieve the summer heat. Without reporting where she was from, she very casually led him to the topic. Master, have you finished editing all these scenes? The editor was grateful for her consideration. Work was over now, so he had spare time to chat with her. I'm not done editing yet. I just finished shorting out the footage and will still re-edit them later. Say, I took a cursory glance at it and promptly noticed a majority of the selected scenes are of Monica. Well, these are all chosen by Director James, the editor answered ambiguously. This little assistant who had followed Pamela for years was, of course, an experienced person. Hence, she chatted about random things for a while to dispel his vigilance before she returned to the topic. There were many scenes Pamela and Monica acted together. Why did director James pick that newbie scene but threw away Pamela's? At this time, the editor was no longer on guard, and frankly answered, I was here when director James chose these shots, and I watched him do the picking. Oh, any gossip? I say, why do you gossip so much? It's better not to ask too many questions in the production team. The editor lit a cigarette and squinted. The little assistant's looks were quite pretty, and she acted coquettishly to him. The editor could not resist confiding. Director James said that Pamela looked too old in some of the scenes. Furthermore, she acted more of a white lotus than a rebellious high school student. Oh, so that's it. The little assistant made a mental note of this as she continued to listen. You haven't seen her act those scenes, but I tell you, even I could not continue watching. The editor confidently added, Previously, I heard that this Pamela is a vase. Regardless of her role, she acts like a white lotus. Crucial point is that her character is a rebellious high school student this time. Yet a few scenes actually showed her pouting or pursing her lips. Director James definitely wants to cut those parts. Oh, Pamela is considered as a big shot, though. Shot and scandals. The editor snuffed out his cigarette and mocked. She's merely packaged by the PR team behind her. Making a hype of topics, grabbing of exposure rates. There's really nothing to say about her stratagem. While she's got a really beautiful face, she's got zero skills in the acting department. And that's her Achilles heel. On top of not having a flair for acting, she still likes to change the script without permission. It's not for her strong backer, which let her be parachuted into the production team, which also prevents director James from kicking her out. He'd never cast her at all. Oh, how about Monica? That little assistant was angry on behalf of her master. She was bent on using Monica as a measuring stick. Hearing that, the editor winked at her. Don't you know that Monica is now the goddess in the production team? You can't anyhow mention her. Why not? Does she really think that she's a big shot now? She's merely a newbie. Why can't we mention her? The little assistant was indignant as she sneered. You don't know this? I reckon she has a bit of background. I've been following the director for nine years now, and I've never once seen him take such care of any actor before. If you look at Martin, when he first started acting in director James's film, he was also harshly scolded. Monica is different, of course. This newbie has acting skills and potential. Even her appearance on screen is better than Pamela's. In the director's eyes, she's definitely a piece of treasure. What do you think of Pamela's acting skills when compared to Monica's, then? The editor jeered. It was too lazy to make more comments, and only spot. Are they even comparable? The little assistant returned to the waiting room reported her findings to Pamela, and exaggerated it a bit. This maddened the artist so much, she flipped the table on the spot. That was too much. What did he mean by a white lotus? What did he mean by a vase with poor acting skills? What did he mean by they could not be compared? This was far too much. She was livid. She could not wait to tear that bitch apart and spare her eyes from seeing that eyesore fluttering in front of her the whole day. 
She had just debuted, but could already be in director James's film. Furthermore, as a main cast, did she feel very smug? It was not only these that she hated about her. Just exactly how lucky could that woman get? Besides the famed director's support, she also had Drake working for her. In these past two days, her behind-the-scenes cuts were trending on Weibo. Her behind-the-scenes live in a school uniform continuously topped the search rankings. Using a classic saying to describe it, the Diana Stark character of hers fulfilled the fantasies of every party involved. Even the author of the novel retweeted that Monica was the forever youthful Diana Stark in the flesh. To generate hype on her, Drake pooled his own resources to produce a steady stream of articles for several days. In his articles, he was all praises for this artiste under his care. But he also did not forget to gain leverage by stepping over Pamela and Claire. Drake's packaging and hype-generating skills were all top-notch. Pamela's PR team was not to be outdone and sent out articles of theirs to fight back. But they could not beat the man in this field, no matter what they did. Why? This was simply because this top star manager had powerful connections with almost all the mainstream media. The gold resources accumulated from Martin's ten years of acting were almost all spent on Monica now. They were generously spent as well. This made many people jealous. Episode 333 Cannot Compare to Monica There were a lot of lost scenes. So James hurried Kevin, the video editor, to start filming again to make up for those. Today, the video editor was sorting out the tapes of the film scenes. Pamela, who happened to be passing by, went in and calmly stood behind him. She watched him sort out the tapes in hopes of seeing how she had performed on screen. She was quite confident in her performance this time. Apparently, it would not matter if she did not look. One look and she realized that her scenes were reduced by a lot. She was shocked. She and many other supporting actors had been edited out from many scenes during the sorting. On principle, although she was not the protagonist, she was still a relatively important character in this film. The scenes she shot were not fewer than Monica's. However, once the editor sorted out these scenes, hers were a whole lot fewer. In many of the scenes that she and the newbie acted together, the screen time was all given to the latter, whereas hers was reduced. There were many important plot bridge sections that merely flashed her scene, and then everything was over. It was clearly an important part, but the screen time was given to that newbie. She estimated that the rookie screen time occupied a whole 70%. The longer she looked, the angrier she felt. Her heart twisted in anger. With no air to vent her anger, she viciously clenched her fists so hard her sharp nails dug into her palm skin. She bit her lower lip hard and then left. Not long after, she sent out an assistant to get her answer. The editor was almost done with his work when the sleuthing assistant presented him with cold drink to relieve the summer heat. Without reporting where she was from, she very casually led him to the topic. Master, have you finished editing all these scenes? The editor was grateful for her consideration. Work was over now, so he had spare time to chat with her. I'm not done editing yet. I just finished shorting out the footage and we'll still re-edit them later. Say, I took a cursory glance at it and promptly noticed a majority of the selected scenes are of Monica. Well... This little assistant who had this person. Hence, she chatted about random things for a while to dispel his vigilance before she returned to the topic. There were many scenes Pamela and Monica acted together. Why did director James pick that newbie scene but threw away Pamela's? At this time, the editor was no longer on guard and frankly answered, 
I was here when Director James chose these shots, and I watched him do the picking. Oh! Any gossip? I say, why do you gossip so much? It's better not to ask too many questions in the production team. The editor lit a cigarette and squinted. The little assistant's looks were quite pretty, and she acted cattishly to him. The editor could not resist confiding. Director James said that Pamela looked too old in some of the scenes. Furthermore, she acted more of a white lotus than a rebellious high school student. Oh, so that's it. The little assistant made a mental note of this as she continued to listen. You haven't seen her act those scenes, but I tell you, even I could not continue watching. The editor confidently added, Previously, I heard that this Pamela is a vase. Regardless of her role, she acts like a white lotus. Crucial point is that her character is a rebellious high school student this time. Yet a few scenes actually showed her pouting or pursing her lips. Director James definitely wants to cut those parts. Huh. Pamela is considered as a big shot, though. It's shot and scandals. The editor snuffed out his cigarette and mocked. She's merely packaged by the PR team behind her. Making a hype of topics, grabbing of exposure rates. There's really nothing to say about her stratagem. While she's got a really beautiful face, she's got zero skills in the acting department. And that's her Achilles heel. On top of not having a flair for acting, she still likes to change the script without permission. It's not for her strong backer, which let her be parachuted into the production team, which also prevents director James from kicking her out. Never cast her at all. Oh, how about Monica? That little assistant was angry on behalf of her master. She was bent on using Monica as a measuring stick. Hearing that, the editor winked at her. Don't you know that Monica is now the goddess in the production team? You can't anyhow mention her. Why not? Does she really think that she's a big shot now? She's merely a newbie. Why can't we mention her? The little assistant was indignant as she sneered. You don't know this? I reckon she has a bit of background. I've been following the director for nine years now, and I've never once seen him take such care of any actor before. If you look at Martin, when he first started acting in director James' film, he was also harshly scolded. Monica is different, of course. Snoopy has acting skills and potential. Even her appearance on screen is better than Pamela's. In the director's eyes, she's definitely a piece of treasure. What do you think of Pamela's acting skills when compared to Monica's, then? The editor jeered. It was too lazy to make more comments, and only spot. Are they even comparable? The little assistant returned to the waiting room, reported her findings to Pamela, and exaggerated it a bit. This maddened the artiste so much, she flipped the table on the spot. That was too much. What did he mean by a white lotus? What did he mean by a vase with poor acting skills? What did he mean by they could not be compared? This was far too much. She was livid. She could not wait to tear that bitch apart and spare her eyes from seeing that eyesore fluttering in front of her the whole day. She had just debuted, but could already be in director James's film. Furthermore, as a main cast, did she feel very smug? It was not only these that she hated about her. Just exactly how lucky could that woman get? Besides the famed director's support, she also had Drake working for her. In these past two days, her behind-the-scenes cuts were trending on Weibo. Her behind-the-scenes live in a school uniform continuously topped the search rankings. Using a classic saying to describe it, the Diana Stark character of hers fulfilled the fantasies of every party involved. Even the author of the novel retweeted that Monica was the forever youthful Diana Stark in the flesh. To generate hype on her, Drake pooled his own resources to produce a steady stream of articles for several days. In his articles, he was all praises for this artiste under his care, but he also did not forget to gain leverage by stepping over Pamela and Claire. Drake's packaging and hype-generating skills were all top-notch. Pamela's PR team was not to be outdone and sent out articles of theirs to fight back, but they could not beat the man in this field 
no matter what they did. Why? This was simply because this top star manager had powerful connections with almost all the mainstream media. The gold resources accumulated from Martin's ten years of acting were almost all spent on Monica now. They were generously spent as well. This made many people jealous. Episode 334. Who is prettier, me or Monica? The crucial point here was that Drake had status and had powerful people behind him. Who would dare to oppose him? Take Pamela's team as an example. They posted several articles criticizing his artist, yet the man simply ordered people to take down those posts. There was no room for even a bit of maneuvering. She, Claire, and the others felt that this was unfair, but did not dare to speak out of anger. Offending this top-notch manager was indubitably akin to seeking death. This manager and the superstar had acquired themselves some Foxcom Entertainment shares in the earlier years, and this let them be among the board of directors. Simply put, the two were among Foxcom's top management. To offend Foxcom's top management, banning and shunning could be done in minutes. As such, Pamela did not have the guts to go against Wraith. She thus let the manager support Monica at her expense. However, now that even the scenes where she and the rookie acted together were so evilly edited out, she could no longer bear it. It was just too maddening. She had never been this angry before. This Monica had such great capabilities. Just exactly what capabilities did this newbie have to receive this manager's utmost care and support? However, since James had given his directives, she did not dare to seek trouble with the rookie. There was a saying that went, The hunter will shoot the bird that sticks out. So many people envious of Monica, someone was bound to mess with her. It was still hard to dispel her anger. Since she could not afford to offend the newbie, there would surely be no problem with venting her anger on the latter's assistant. Hence, during lunch, she accidentally spilled her scalding hot tea on Isabel. The assistant cried out in pain. When she lowered her head, she found her arm that was splashed with tea turning red in an instant. It was a hot and sunny day. As the scorching rays shone on her body and arm, it hurt her so much that tears streamed down her face. Hugging her scalding arm, she bit her lower lip tightly and looked up at her with tearful eyes. She did not dare to voice out her grievance. The haughty actress gave out a fake smile while eyeing her with condensation. Oh dear, it's not done on purpose. I'm sorry. With that, she looked away and murmured, if you didn't bump into me, my pup wouldn't tilt your way. What a waste. It was a casual remark, sans a bit of remorse. It did not seem like an apology at all. She made it sound as if her burn were unworthy of even a mention, and could not compare to her spilled tea. The assistant felt extremely wronged. She did not bump into her at all. Clearly, the other purposely splashed that boiling hot tea on her. Now, she was even venomously slandering her. She clearly knew that this pompous actress was venting her anger on her because the limelight was all on the artiste in her care. This kind of thing was a common occurrence in the production team. Furthermore, this was not the first time that this actress had vented her anger on the poor assistants in this manner. She could only blame herself for not avoiding her. Her tears trickled down, as the pretty woman walked to her side. Lowering her head, the actress smiled, yet spoke in a sinisterly cold voice. Go back and tell your master. Don't go too far. Does she really think that with Director James's support, she can be so unbridled? The assistant nodded in tears and stared at her incredulously. The actress sneered. 
the threat in her eyes could not be any more obvious. She dares to rob me of the limelight? She really doesn't know her place. Make her remember that I'm the real top actress in Foxcom. Is she qualified to compete with me for status? Her words struck the assistant dumb, and she could only watch the actress arrogantly leave. Pamela triumphantly returned to the waiting room. Having vented her anger, she now felt thoroughly refreshed. She met a production assistant along the way, and since she was in high spirits, she deigned to greet him. She was notorious for being haughty and snobbish in the production team. Because of her affluent backer, she was used to strutting around all high and mighty and doing whatever she pleased on set. She did not give anyone a good attitude and always presented a lofty front. Forget about polite greetings. If she did not roll her eyes, that would already be deemed as her being in a good mood. Hence, the production assistant felt a little flustered and then smiled back in greeting. Sister Pamela. She chatted him up. His production assistant still needed to prepare the roster of actors for the next scene, so he could not chat with her for long and hastily bid her goodbye. The actress unexpectedly called out to him. Stop there. I have something to ask you. Shocked, he turned around and gave her a puzzled look. Sister Pamela, what questions do you have? Feel free to ask. I ask you, between me and Monica, who's prettier? With that, she raised her hair, proudly lifted her chin, and winked. That wink was too seductive. The production assistant slowly. She had a pair of electrifying eyes, a natural seductress. However, returning to his senses, and finally registering her question, he froze. This question was too tough for him. This was his first time being so troubled. If he could not answer this question tactfully, both sides would feel offended. There was no satisfactory answer at all. Should he say that this actress before him was prettier? If words of this reached Monica, though, he would certainly offend her. Still, if he answered that the newbie was prettier, he reckoned that he would be swept out of the door immediately. Whoever dared to sing a different tune to Pamela would definitely lose their livelihood. Alas, he could not afford to offend Monica as well. He was there at the scene in the music room that day. He had also witnessed Monica being taken away by a man that night. A man whom James was servile would only be a top brass. After that, with great difficulty, he managed to find out this Big Shot's identity. The CEO of Make Wealth Financial Group, Stephen Lewis. He was but a mere production assistant. So he of course had no right to meet that man prior to that night. Still, from what he had seen, Monica and that man's relationship could not be called shallow. Everyone working in the set was naturally sharp. They understood that offending anyone in their line of work was a big no-no. Otherwise, those with backgrounds to speak of would fire them in a matter of minutes. Feeling troubled, the production assistant hesitated. His hesitation annoyed the actress. Is my question difficult to answer? Or do you think that she's prettier than me? Sister Pamela, please let me off. Don't make things difficult for me, he pleaded. I like Sister Pamela the best. You're exquisitely stunning. It's like a goddess from high above. Can't you directly answer me? Say that I'm prettier than Monica. Say it. I... I don't dare. What is there to be afraid of? <laughs> she laughed. She's just a newbie. Don't tell me you're afraid of a newbie. Sister Pamela, it's not a matter of whether I'm afraid or not. But I really don't dare to offend her. The production assistant decided to confess. What do you mean? The actress's eyes gleamed. Are you actually afraid of her? Episode 335
Let her apologize to you. In Pamela's eyes, that newbie was merely a pushover. If not for Drake at the latter's back, she would have long gotten rid of the thorn in her flesh. The production assistant gritted his teeth and pleaded, Sister Pamela, you're truly the beautiful goddess in my heart. But if you insist on having me choose which of you two is better, then you are really wishing for my death. He wiped away the cold sweat on his forehead. He had just said something against his conscience. He preferred Monica over Pamela. Setting aside other things, just character alone, the former was way more down to earth. Many rookies acted like divas solely because they had powerful backers. Meanwhile, Monica was never like that. On set, she was humble, gentle, and polite even. She also took extra care not to disrupt the peace and harmony. Even to a small production assistant like him, she was very approachable and accommodating. Pamela and Claire, in contrast, were only ever bossy. It was hot and sunny these past few days. Seeing the production assistants and camera crew under the scorching sun, she ordered a few boxes of cold drinks out of her pockets and let her assistant distribute them to everyone for them to be relieved from the heat. One must understand that this kind of action in the production team lowered her stage presence. Most stars were usually haughty. An example was the superstar. Although his character was not bad, he seldom interacted with small flies like them. After all, the image of a star must be maintained. She, for her part, never put on airs. She could even mix around with a lowly log keeper. Everyone was genuinely fond of her. As for looks, she disliked making comparison between the two. One was seductive, and the other was pure. One was mature, and the other was youthful. In his eyes, Monica's beauty had a youthful energy, and was not artificial at all. Furthermore, with the application of makeup, Features could adapt to the challenges of any role. Pamela's acting path was very narrow with her overly coquettish face. For instance, if she was requested to portray a queen or a mischievous lady, she could only ever present herself as a white lotus. Monica's acting path was the opposite of that. First, her features could pull off any types of makeup and did not look out of sorts with whatever role was thrown her way. James's eyes were very picky, yet he was only full of praises for her. Just as the atmosphere was starting to get awkward, the actress's trusted aide, whom she had planted at Clara's side, ran over and pulled her aside. The aide carefully asked, Sister Pamela, earlier, did you splash hot tea on Monica's little assistant? How did you know? Sans the slightest remorse, she laughingly said, I did not do that on purpose. I just heard from someone that a bubble had formed on that little assistant's hand. Monica's still filming and hasn't returned. So try to give that assistant an apology while her master is still in the dark. What of her knowing about it? She shrugged. Can she beat me up? Sister Pamela, listen to me. You'd better hurry and apologize to Isabel. What? She glared at her and then sneered. You want me to apologize to a small assistant? No choice. I'm kindly reminding you. She did not dare to speak clearly and only carefully reminded her. You're not here that day, but I was. That newbie, she has a bit of background. Sister Pamela, you'd better not offend her. In terms of background, can she compare to me? She snorted disdainfully to express her disagreement. The person merely shook her head and gave an ambiguous reply. It's hard to say, Pamela demanded. What do you mean by that? Her aide refused to say any more, though. As such, she did not take her words to heart. No matter how big her background was, could it be bigger than the sky? Pamela had Sylvester behind her back. In the afternoon, Monica's part had ended and she returned to her waiting room, only to find her assistant organizing the makeup tools with red eyes from crying. 
Seeing her return, Isabel promptly put on a forced smile. Monica, you're back! You? Well, what's wrong with you? She was a very sensitive person. One glance at her assistant's face, and she could tell that something was wrong with her. As she walked closer to look at her face, she found out that her eyes were unbelievably swollen. She frowned in concern. Why did you cry? I didn't. The assistant hurriedly hid her face from her. There were a few reasons why she was doing this. Her artist treated her very well. If she knew that she got bullied by Pamela, she would definitely confront that actress. She did not want her to offend the actress just for her. There was no need, was there? Her arm merely suffered a minor burn. It would get better after washing it with cold water. It was not a big patch, too. It would be fine after the bubble subsided. She only wanted to let this matter go. Seeing her evasive action, Monica was slightly displeased. Isabel, what's wrong with you? Why does your expression look strange? Tell me, did someone bully you while I was away? The assistant hurriedly shook her head. No! Don't overthink this! You're lying! Your eyes are all swollen! You wouldn't cry for nothing! She brushed aside her hair with heartache. But out of the corner of her eyes, she saw that the sleeve for her assistant's other arm was tightly pulled down. It was a hot and sweltering day with the sun at its zenith. Usually, at this time, both sleeves would be folded up. Right now, however, one of Isabel's arms was well hidden by her shirt sleeve. She found this to be clear, so she grabbed her arm. Alas, it happened to be right where the assistant had her burn. Isabel winced from the pain. She tried to keep it in, but in the end, she had to utter a pain-filled groan. Her arm recoiled from her touch. Her artist was startled. Quickly holding her arm and lifting the sleeve, she saw a red burn on her flesh. Shocked, she urgently questioned, how did this happen? It's nothing. I accidentally scalded myself. Who did this to you? Her voice rose an octave. The assistant trembled. Sensing her artiste's anger, she helplessly confessed the entire matter. Monica was livid. How could she go overboard? Pamela's temper has always been like this. If things don't go her way, she'll throw a tantrum. Everyone is used to it already. Isabel choked in her grievance. Monica, do you remember the assistant that I mentioned to you last time? She's that actress who poured water on her assistant. It burned a layer of that poor girl's skin. But what of it? She has a strong backer, so no one can afford to offend her. Does having a powerful supporter give her the right to be so lawless? She found this to be ridiculous. This is too much. It's simply too extreme. It doesn't, but no one dares to offend her. It was already lucky to only be splashed with tea by her. She's used to being unruly and acting all high and mighty. It's fine if she bullies me, but she can't bully my people. She retracted her hand and went out. The assistant was alarmed by this. Monica, what are you going to do? Let her apologize to you and make amends. She spat out each word. Episode 336 It is scary to be uncultured. She merely was away for half a day, and her staff already got bullied. Pamela was simply intolerable. Isabel was adamant to stop her from going to the actress. Monica! We need not offend her. Pamela is quite powerful. She usually hangs out with plenty of rich and powerful men, so she can easily suppress anyone. In fact, many female stars are at her beck and call. We can't win against her. I'm not going to argue with her. I'm just going to make her see reason. Monica answered unhappily. Reason? Her assistant chuckled wryly. This circle is like this. They don't reason, and simply care if one has potential, power, background, backing, and resources. Those in this circle only value things. In their eyes, the reason is but a joke. 
I don't wish to add on to your trouble. When I've chosen this line of work, I have already mentally prepared myself for stuff like this. All right. I have my views. In any case, I still want her to give you an apology today. With that, she held her hand and proceeded to the actress's waiting room. Somehow, as Isabel followed her artiste, she felt that the latter's image was suddenly a lot bigger. She had worked as an assistant for other stars before. The so-called assistant could be described as a cow slogging hard. If the star was unhappy, the assistant was up for a scolding and beating. It was really tough to be an assistant. It might look glamorous on the surface to work close to so many stars, but in reality, an assistant suffered the most and had to watch the faces of other people. To Isabel, a star who would really treat their aide as a friend did not exist at all. The appearance of her artiste controverted this cognition of hers. It turned out that a sincere friendship between a star and an assistant was possible. She felt truly grateful to her artiste. Pamela was in the VIP waiting room designated for her. It was more luxurious and grander than Monica's. She was very fastidious and strict about the preparation for this set. This waiting room was, in fact, meant for Monica, but it was snatched away by Pamela. The former did not mind and gave it up easily. It was only a waiting room to her and held not much importance. Reaching the doorway, she entered freely the room. Pamela was in the middle of retouching her makeup, and seeing her walk in with Isabel, she more or less knew what this was all about. She had expected this to happen. She was unafraid of a mere rookie confronting her. It was just as well. She could put her foot down and teach her a lesson too. Hence, she smilingly asked, What's the matter? Sister Pamela, are you busy? Monica was not angry, as she had expected her to be. Instead, she had a smile on her face and an elegant demeanor. This type of elegance which was like an aristocratic temperament seeping through the belts, was different from hers. The other was innately graceful, whereas she depended on expensive makeup and designer clothes to achieve such a noble aura. When the two standing together like this, it was obvious who had the upper hand. A little sidetracked, she answered, Not busy. What was unbeknown to her was that Monica's smile had the effect of subduing her presence. Well, I just returned from filming and saw that my assistant's arm was scalded. Even though she did not mention anything to me, I heard from those present then that it was splashed by you. With that being the case, I'd like to ask your side of the story. It was indeed done by me. Pamela raised a brow and admitted to it frankly. I didn't do it on purpose, though. Are you two here to blame me? Pamela stood up slowly as she said that, and projected herself with all the elegance and allure that she could muster, acting as if she were the high and mighty queen of the world. She walked to Monica and sized her up with condescension, apparently disdainful of her confrontation. Oh, are you Virgin Mary? actually confronting me because of an assistant. What does it matter if I did that? Her eyes gleamed sinisterly. I did it on purpose. And so what? There was silent provocation on her face. I did that to your assistant. So what can you do about it? Monica's eyes narrowed. A hint of controlled anger rose from within. She was obviously this actress's target. Was that why she did this to her assistant? Why was her heart so vicious? At the back, seeing the challenge in the actress's eyes and the constant forbearance that was about to explode in her artiste's eyes, Isabel feared that the matter would blow up. Incessantly tugging on her hand, she whispered, Let's go! Let's go! She did not want to cause trouble. Pamela caught sight of the assistant's nervous look and could not help but laugh. <laughs> Look, your assistant wants you to take your leave quickly. Even she knows not to offend me. Only you don't understand who you're dealing with. 
At this, Monica raised a brow with mockery in her eyes. Monica, here's a piece of advice. Don't let director James's doting go to your head. What of you being the main lead? And what of you being very popular now? I'm telling you this. On set, you're a junior, and I'm a senior. I'll have to trouble you not to give attitude the whole day and act all high and mighty. It's irking my eyes. As Pamela, seemingly unmindful of the other's presence, spoke without restraint, Monica's mocking laughter cut in. The former froze at her laughter, and the latter proceeded to mock her. I heard that you had entered the entertainment industry with only a high school diploma. <laughs> what do you mean? Pamela was stunned. People mocked her for two things, lack of culture and low education. This had always made her uncomfortable, like a fishbone stuck in her throat. While her public image was a degree-holder actress, insiders knew that her diploma was forged. Many ridiculed her for being the cliché big-breasted female with no brains. She really had no knack for studying. Monica smiled and continued, while academic attainment shouldn't be used for criticism, as there are some people with low education that are still very cultured, in your case, from what I saw today, you really should study more. With your current IQ and EQ level, it's really tiring to communicate with you. You! The artiste smiled faintly. It's scary to be uncultured. Her words hit the actress's sore spot. Her face suddenly changed from anger. Unmindful of actress's danger, she continued with her verbal attacks. Is this because I don't worship you like everyone else? Pamela kept mum for a while in her anger. She was truly incensed now. Monica, how dare you? Hey, Pamela, are you sick? The other interrupted her impatiently. What? With unrestrained viciousness in her eyes, Monica bluntly stated, I think you're sick. It's a severe condition of princess disease. The actress was violently stunned. This bitch dared to say that I have a princess disease? At the back, Isabel was shocked. Never would she have thought that this gentle and elegant Monica, once anchored, could speak words laced with poison. It was too poisonous. Episode 337. I have a reverse scale, too. Monica took a step toward her and sneeringly enunciated, Some people are spoiled and haughty because since birth, they've been lavished with love from many people. Others are pretentious and arrogant. They're clearly not princesses. They have the bad temper of princesses. This is called the princess disease. Do you understand? Pamela, whose face was contorted with rage, glared at Monica while gritting her teeth. The latter stared right into the former's eyes and demanded in a firm tone, Apologize to her. On what basis? Pamela, apologize to her. Monica, don't you go overboard. It's you who has gone overboard. She lifted her chin in disdain and spat, Apologize to her. Shut up. The actress raised her hand and sent a tight slap on her face. Seeing this, Isabel was left speechless to shock. However, her artiste merely laughed, grabbed the actress's wrist, and returned the slap. Smack. It was not heavy, yet it sounded solid and crisp. This slap is for me. Her face showed no surprise, and her tone lacked emotion. Yet that statement was filled with an inviolable dignity. The actress was stunned. In the time that she was in a trance, Monica had already walked to the table and picked up a glass. She returned to face the actress, and with a jerk of her wrist, 
Splash the water inside it on the actress's face. Splash. The water splattered on Pamela's makeup and dripped down her eyelashes, nose, and cheek. Unprepared for the situation, the actress breathed in a mouthful of cool air, closed her eyes, and allowed the water to drip. Monica slowly said, This is for Isabel. With that, she paid no further heed to the fury on the actress's face and just led her assistant away. Pamela was livid. At the back, her assistant scrambled to pick up a towel and wipe the water on her face. With this action, her makeup was smudged and ruined. The assistant was careful, but she still accidentally hurt her. Incensed, she pushed her aside and ordered everyone in the room, Get out! Scram! Get the hell out of my sight! The assistants looked at one another and then ran away for fear of getting implicated. She was left alone in the huge waiting room. She sat herself before the dressing mirror and looked into it. Her face was horrendous. She looked ghastly. Even her clothes were drenched. Her makeup could not be done under an hour. And as for her clothes, she would have to borrow from the fashion team again. She recalled that she still had an act in the next scene. That rookie obviously wanted to embarrass her. Very well. Monica, you just wait. Back in their waiting room, Isabel was still looking in shock at Monica, who was calmly sitting in front of the dressing mirror. A flashback of that earlier scene crept into her mind, and it inevitably frightened her. Looking at her artiste's calm face, she tremblingly asked, Monica, aren't you afraid? Afraid of what? The other was baffled. Afraid that Pamela would take revenge on you. Monica smiled and thought that she was just making a fuss. It's not as if Pamela's a monster. Do you think she'll eat me up? The assistant's lips twitched. Monica, I'm very grateful for your help. I'm more afraid of her taking revenge on you. After all, no one has ever spoken to her in such a manner. I know. She put down the powder in her hand and looked at her solemnly. I know how Pamela is like, and that's why I never easily offend her. Isabel, you should know that I dislike causing trouble. If I can give in, I will. That was why, when that actress occupied her waiting room, she did not argue with her, but chose to give in instead. The actress had repeatedly harassed, ostracized, and spoken ill of her, but she had never once risen to the bait. She only wanted to finish this filming in peace. This doesn't mean that I'm weak and that everything should be born. I have my bottom line, too. She calmly looked at her. She can go against me, but I won't stay silent if she implicates the people around me. The assistant was deeply shocked by her solemn words. Perhaps in the eyes of many, I seem to be a weak person. But, be it cowardice or timidity, everyone has a reverse scale. Isabel was moved by her sincere words, but her face still had worries that could not be hidden. What... What if she takes revenge on you? Monica, you need not offend such people just because of me. If she takes revenge on you, what should you do? There's always a solution to a problem, she replied lightly. The assistant looked at her calm face with worry still. In the afternoon, there was a scene with Monica and Pamela in it, but the latter was no show. After waiting for a period and she still did not appear, the director was so angry that he nearly cut the scene. In the end, an assistant rushed in to report that the actress had a fever. Fever? James swore. He had only heard of getting a heat stroke in this weather, and never of getting a fever before. He did not know what she was up to again. Forget it. He hurriedly arranged for the next scene. Because of the actress's sudden sick leave, this scene could only be postponed. 
Monica frowned in suspicion. She did not know what the actress was up to as well. Did that splash cause her to have a fever? Is she that weak? Isabel whispered to her. Monica, she most likely couldn't touch up her makeup in time and placed her drenched clothes. But she's afraid that James would blame her. So she found an excuse. Only then did she understand. The afternoon scene ended, and due to the hot weather, the director wrapped up today's shooting ahead of schedule. In these past few days, the filming had been progressing well, which put the director in a good mood. He proposed to treat Martin and Monica to a meal. He felt that after that incident, there was tension between the two. Everyone was very engaged during filming, but once it was over, there was practically no interaction between the two main leads. Even during filming, Superstar was distracted and a bit absent-minded. He even forgot some of his lines because of this unknown distraction. While they were just minor mistakes, he still saw through them. Hence, after mulling over, he decided to improve the relationship over a meal. Monica apologetically rejected him, however. James, I'm sorry. I still have something on later. What's the matter? Well, go back to take care of my father. In fact, Matthew was back in his hometown for a funeral. Since the little guy was alone at home, she could not help but worry. Although Frederick chauffeured the boy to and from school, it was rare for the filming to end early so she wanted to take this chance to give her child a surprise by returning home early. Naturally, she could not confess this to the director. If he knew that she had a child and the news leaked, it would only bring inconvenience to her life. Episode 338 Do Not Deprive Andres of His Happiness once Monica got back home, to give the little guy a surprise, she moved about stealthily. Upon entering the door, she saw her kid's school bag on the floor. She proceeded into the kitchen, but still did not see the little guy's figure. She then placed the groceries that she had just bought from the market on the countertop. Sweeping a glance across the groceries, the combination of meat and vegetables seemed quite sumptuous. She entered the study room next. As she opened the door, she found the little guy scrolling through Instagram. Over the past two days, he had paid special attention to the dynamics of the Forbidden Love official Instagram fan page. For the filming, his mommy usually left home early and returned home late, so he was unable to spend as much time with her as before. Only through the movie's behind-the-scenes footage, which was featured on Instagram, could he get updates of his mommy's daily activities in the production team? Hearing the door open, he lifted his head in surprise. When he saw that it was his mother, astonishment appeared on his face. Mommy, you're back! With that, he flew all the way into her warm embrace. Mommy, Andres misses you a lot. My silly baby. It's only been a day since we've last seen each other. Feeling a mixture of amusement and helplessness, she tapped his pretty nose. The little boy raised his little face and seriously said, Is it? Why do I feel that I haven't seen Mommy for a year? What an exaggeration. This is called a day drags past like a year, stupid Mommy. He smiled softly as he placed a kiss on her cheek. Why is Mommy back so early today? Mommy misses Andres too. She pinched his chubby cheeks. What a nice feeling. She could not help pinching it a few more times. The little guy's face was devoid of any grievance as he smiled up at her like a cherub only meant for her. Huh? The little guy seemed to be a little meatier now. At least his face, which was chubby and cute, was no longer as thin as before. Gee, how is my baby so cute? She rubbed her face against his. The little guy's glistering eyes curved. He enjoyed this intimacy very much. If possible, he would let mommy pinch his face for a thousand years, ten thousand years, 
then you would also not feel tired. Mommy is so pretty, that's why. Thanks to Mommy's beautiful jeans, Andres is also very cute. This compliment made her heart sore. She then proceeded to rub his silky hair happily. Oh, my Andres mouth is so sweet. Mommy loves you so much. <laughs> he solemnly emphasized. Andre speaks no lie. No lie. All right. Good. Mommy shall go watch TV first. After I'm done making dinner, I'll massage Mommy's shoulders. She nodded. The little boy thus plunged into the kitchen. She sat on the sofa and watched TV while she waited. Coincidentally, she switched onto an entertainment channel, which was airing the recently ended press conference of the Forbidden Love. When it was Pamela's turn to be interviewed, a reporter raised a sharp and shrill question. Pamela, there are a lot of fans on Instagram comparing you and Monica Thames. What can you say about it? In the face of a camera, the actress's face exuded undisguised arrogance and contempt as she shot back. You're asking me for my opinion to that? How about I ask you instead? Where is the comparison in this question? The reporter said. I think this comparison is quite impossible. The actress laughed coldly. Oh, this is merely a way for some people to generate hype. I don't see a need to respond. Monica's expression soured. She picked up the remote control and switched off the TV. How annoying. Forget it. What I can't see won't hurt me. As she stepped into the kitchen, she saw the heated pot on the gas stove. With a knife in his hand, Andre swiftly chopped green onion into sections, threw the chopped pieces into the pot together with garlic cloves, and stir-fried the ingredients. She was gobsmacked at this. Each time she saw her son's superb knife skills, she would feel relative amazement. Moments later, the aroma of exquisitely cooked food wafted through the air. She sniffed it in intoxication, her tense brows relaxing a little. As long as this cute baby was waiting for her at home, everything would be fine. Her greatest fortune was to give birth to this pair of babies, Andres and Sam. This was especially the case for Andre, her little sweetheart. No matter how frustrated she got outside, once she returned home, all those unhappiness and frustrations quickly dissipated in the presence of his bright smile. Her little sweetheart seemed to have magical powers, always had the ability to dissipate her negative emotions. How nice. This was probably the so-called happiness. While she did not know what children in his age bracket were like, she still thought that he was a little too mature for his age. Well, she fell into deep thought. Was she a little unqualified as a mother? Amid her musing, the boy finished cooking a dish. When he turned his head, he saw her standing at the door with a strange look on her face. He raised a brow curiously. Mommy, what's wrong? She regained her senses immediately. Oh, nothing much. Did I bother you? His lips twitched. No, it's quite smoky in the kitchen. Mommy should get out. If not, you'll be smoked to become a haggard old woman. She was amused by his words. What haggard old woman? Smokes are going to you too. Aren't you scared of smoking yourself? He smiled gracefully, but kept quiet. His eyes seemed to be saying that he was so unlucky to have a mommy who was clueless on how it worked. She was struck by his expression. Hey, 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 I protest. Those eyes of yours are obviously mocking mommy. Andre never despised this, though. With that, the little boy picked up the vegetables at the side, poured water over them, and carefully washed each. He said, Andres has said it before. Mommy is in charge of beauty, while Andres is in charge of supporting the family. Hearing these words, while she understood that it was a joke, for some reason, she faintly felt guilty toward this little boy. Hence, she stood behind him and hugged his soft body. Andres, 
Mommy also feels that I'm not qualified enough. Shocked, he promptly retorted. Who said that? Did anyone speak ill of Mommy? It must be Stefan. That man must have accused Mommy of being irresponsible right in her face. In that moment, the man in the CEO's office of the Lewis Group gracefully sneezed for being unjustly implicated. She shook her head. Uh, Andres, you don't have to cook anymore. Mommy will do the cooking from here on. No, he firmly rejected. Huh? Why? She was baffled and then defended herself in a solemn manner. Mommy's cooking is also very delicious. It's just that sometimes the standard drops a bit. But it's only for a little bit. The boy was firm in his answer, though. I can't. It's because Andres thinks that Mommy eating his cooking is a very fortunate thing. Oh? She was surprised. So, Mommy, don't deprive Andres of this small happiness. Episode 339, Hostility Crisis Andres turned around to hug Monica's waist while gently smiling at her. To capture Mommy's heart, I must first capture Mommy's stomach. This way Mommy will depend on Andres forever. His world was fraught with treachery. He had experienced the dark side of the world, with its bloodbath ahead of other children. His heart was polarized into two extreme sides. One side was evil and dark. It could skillfully and easily toy with this huge world. Another side was innocent and kind. The side, which could even be described as pure, was shown to his mother alone. It could be said that his mother was the last piece of pure land in his heart. He also tried hard to protect her from the darkness of this world guarding this piece of pure land with all his might. He maintained a child's most innocent and pure side in the presence of his mother. He wanted her to depend on him and never leave him. This way, she would be with him forever. She broke into laughter. Oh, my baby, even if your cooking isn't good, Mommy will never leave you. It's clear that many people are out to take Mommy away from me, though. He grumbled. There was Sam and Stefan. Even Martin had feelings for his mommy. He was unsettled. On one hand, he understood that someone would eventually appear at his mommy's side to accompany her for a lifetime. On the other hand, he childishly wanted his mommy to be satisfied with only him. Whatever his mommy wanted, he could give it to her. Was this not enough? He was in a fix. He could not learn to let go and to watch Mommy be in someone else's embrace. Is this type of thought abnormal? He fretted in his heart. Sometimes he felt that his possessiveness was overboard. He clearly knew that this type of thought was irrational and unrealistic, but he could not control himself. He was at a loss for a bit. She was his family. He could give her family love but could not give her the love of a lover. He should not be this selfish. This was undoubtedly a kidnap. He turned around, picked up the knife again, and slowly proceeded to slice the meat. This problem, however, continued to stick in his head stubbornly. His mind was confused and muddled. In his days, he paid no attention to his hand movements and accidentally cut his finger. However, he was still immersed in his thoughts and did not at all notice the acute pain radiating from his fingertip. By the time he regained his senses and looked down, the chopping board was already stained with blood. He was aware of the pain in his hand now. He hesitated to check his fingertip, where there was an urgent flow of blood. He opened his mouth, yet he did not spout a word. He did not feel much pain. Monica was stunned to see this, and hurried over to hold his hand up for a careful inspection. Fortunately, it was merely a shallow cut. She cleaned his wound, 
the tree of the plaster and bandaged it with that. Why were you so careless? She frowned at him. With a start, the boy shook his head. He got distracted earlier. While pondering on things, he paid no heed to the matter at hand. Go sit on the sofa first. Mummy will handle the rest. She proceeded to carry him to the sofa. He obediently nodded with a pout. She then returned to the kitchen. Her son did more than half the work. The vegetables had been segmented and arranged on the plate. As such, the rest of the work progressed without a hitch and was completed shortly after. All the dishes were presented on the table. Andres, who was sitting in front of the dining table, could not stop his lips from curving upward at the sight of this delicious bread. The apron with teddy bear print on Monica's body was identical to his. He had personally selected these aprons for their design. Just as he sat at the table, the doorbell rang. The mother-son pair exchanged glances. Who is it? Father? He was at his hometown for a funeral and said that he would be gone for half a month. Had he returned early? She stood up and went to the door. The moment she opened the door, a cute little head popped in. Sam, who had popped in his head to check the situation, did not expect to bump into his stunned mother. He opened his mouth with the intention of calling Mommy, but with his serious and shy disposition, he was clueless on how to act cutesy or behave in an endearing manner. In the end, that word would just not come out. He was caught in a predicament. He had clearly prepared so much to say. Even though the boy failed to produce a sound, his mouth movements clearly showed that he had just called her mommy. She, who saw it, could not help but break into laughter. This child was still quite shy. The little guy's sudden visit surprised her, but even more so, she felt immense joy in her heart. Why are you here? Hearing activity at the door, Andres curiously faced backward. The moment he saw Sam, the contented smile on his face faded a little. Why was it him? Sam, why was he here? Sam walked in quietly with Stefan in tow. The man declared, I intended to bring Sam to the script reading, but I heard news that the filming had ended early today. His subtext, So I'm here with the child for a free meal. Andres gritted his teeth in anger. This pair of father and son dared to come over blatantly for a free meal. Shameless. Since the man looked relaxed, did that mean that the Lewis Group's network problem had been fixed? It seemed that he was too light-handed. In just a few days, the network had been restored to normalcy. Next time, he would not be so lenient anymore. Thought of the man threatening him before with that evil face made the boy bite hard into the chopsticks. His mood plunged. Once the man stepped into the house, his glance landed on Andres. As if in provocation, he blurted out with a raised brow, One day, there was a provocative meaning to his words. The other two in the house were confused, totally clueless on what his words should mean. Andres, for his part, clearly understood it. One day. Everything was fixed within a day. This was indeed a provocation. All right. Was this man challenging him? In that case, he would destroy the Lewis Group's network later. He would see what this man could do about it by then. The man seemed to get a read of his thoughts and smirked, his eyes glinting with silent provocation. Cry it. The gaze of both father and son met and clashed in midair, and for a moment, the air was charged with electricity. The presence of the two was unbelievably strong. In perceptibility, their dreadful aura spread to every corner of the living room in that instant. Even she felt the tacit confrontation between the father and son. It was too frightening. She was truly over the moon about Sam's visit, knowing that the man had only listened to her request.
Episode 340 Father and Sons Competing for Affection Due to Monica expressing her desire to see Sam and make up for the child's lack of maternal love in his childhood, Stefan brought the little guy over. While she was surprised by the little lad's visit, she was also quite happy to see him. Andres, however, was not. Even after exchanging greetings with him, the younger brother looked at his older brother with indifference. She broke out in a cold sweat and hastily asked, Sam, are you hungry? Do you want to eat first? The boy shyly pursed his lips and quietly nodded. She then carried him to the table. However, the moment she picked him up, the boy's younger brother instantly shifted his gaze onto him with covetous eyes. Although the older brother could not see his younger brother's frosty eyes, he still felt an oppressive force on him. This feeling was akin to a sharp thorn pricking his body countless times. He shuddered. Helpless of the situation, she cast her pleading eyes on Andres. Seeing the plea in his mommy's eyes, he unwillingly relented a little. Still, he had a condition. Mommy, sit right next to Andres. He patted the seat next to him. She immediately sat over at his side. Knowing that he was feeling a bout of intense jealousy, she felt very helpless in her heart. <laughs> in a way, this trait was basically inherited from his father. His propensity to be suffocating and petty in his jealousy was, indubitably, the same as the man's. One look, and anyone could tell that the two were biologically related. She clapped her hands. All right, let's eat. After which, it became awkwardly silent. The table had become a battlefield between the father and sons. The three people kept exchanging glances over the table. The atmosphere abruptly plummeted. There was not too much to say that they were engaged in a heated battle and that there was gunpowder in the air. Her smile froze and then cooled off at the sight of this heated exchange between the father and sons before she broke out into a cold sweat. Was there a need for this? They were clearly father and sons. Why did it seem that they were meeting their enemies? Even their eyes had turned red. She turned to shoot the man and Sam a warning look as she weakly laughed. <sighs> Andres, shall we eat? Huh? Mommy! The boy pointed to Stefan and complained. This uncle is staring fiercely at me. The man's face turned cold. This child changed expressions faster than flipping through a book. When did he ever stare fiercely at him? The boy only knew how to tattle on him. She naturally defended the boy. Glaring at the man warningly, she reproached, Stefan, it's enough. Behave and eat your meal. He kept his silence as he raised his brow. He felt immensely wrong. This child was obviously a bully. Suddenly, Andres cooed, Mommy, feed Andres. She nodded and picked up his mini rice bowl. Sam cooed too. Feed me too. Me too, Stefan interrupted. Monica rolled her eyes. Hey, that's enough. Do you think I have three heads and six arms? Andres chimed in. Mommy, no need to bother with them. Sam blinked at her with his pitiful doe eyes. Each pitiful look of his was undoubtedly a blow to her heart. Inevitably, she went soft-hearted. Stefan announced, Sam, if mommy won't feed you, daddy will. With tears in his eyes, he cried out, Mom, I don't want daddy to feed me. He then gazed up at her. Mommy! Three heads and six arms means a being with formidable powers. Mommy. The atmosphere froze for a moment. Everyone could not help but be startled. When Sam realized that he had just called her Mommy, he shyly pursed his lips and frowned innocently. Looking at him, Andres was momentarily stunned. This call, akin to a heart-piercing arrow, made Monica lose her resistance instantly. 
There was no doubt that she was a mother. Her child was softly crying out for her. Even if her heart were as hard as a rock, it would still crumble at this. Smiling slightly, she acquiesced. All right, mommy will feed you. Tense, she stood up, went over to Sam's side, and sat next to him. Andres could only watch her pick up a spoon and patiently feed his older brother. The little lad tasted a mouthful of the food and widened his eyes in surprise at its taste, gushing. Wow, it's delicious, she proudly revealed. Today's dinner was prepared by Andres. Stefan froze again at her words as he tasted a mouthful of the roasted chicken with glutinous rice. Were all these dishes prepared by Andres? That was simply unbelievable. Regardless of the food's exquisite appearance, just its taste was already comparable to those made by a five-star chef. In fact, it might even surpass that. It was no wonder that she always bragged about the boy's culinary skills being the best. From what he had seen thus far, it was worthy of that praise. The boy indeed had a flair for cooking. However, the man raised a slightly suspicious eyes at the boy's little hand that was holding the chopsticks. It was pink and tender, as well as slightly chubby. It was hard to imagine what kind of miracle his hand had created. How did he perfect such cooking skills? He was only seven. Could he even hold a knife? The latter lightly looked at him and snorted in disdain, as if saying, I shall let both of you off today. Besides his mother, he had yet to cook for anyone else. If she was not at home, he would not even cook for Matthew. Sam remained intoxicated in the exquisite spread, unable to extricate himself. Bliss. He was so blissful that he was going to shed tears. Compared to the cuisines prepared by his younger brother, the repetitive recipes of the Lewis residence of Seth had long made him feel dull and bored. His brother's cooking style was certainly different. He never followed a routine when he cooked, and his repertoire of recipes was endless. Hence, as long as he was the one doing the cooking, one would not tire of eating it, even after days and years had passed. Sam thought that he was done for. His younger brother's cooking was just his taste. Since he took a liking for this taste, once he returned to the Lewis residence, would everything he eat afterward taste bland? There was an increase in his appetite, and this gave his mother a pleasant surprise. This child's appetite was pretty good. He wiped clean two bowls of rice. In her moment of happiness, she forgot about her other child, who was sitting beside her without eating a grain of rice. Andres dejectedly felt that he had fallen out of favor. Mommy only took care of his older brother and did not care for him anymore. He deliberately did not eat a mouthful of rice in hopes of her taking notice of his unhappiness and coaxing him to eat. However, even after staring at her for quite a while, his mommy still did not take notice of him at all. Her whole focus was centered on to his older brother. His eyes were filled with grievance and mournful tears, which were threatening to spill at any moment. This pair of father and son was simply too repulsive. They must have the intention to snatch mommy away from him. He hated them the most. I hope you enjoyed the episodes. Thank you for listening. See you on the next episodes. Please don't forget to share, like, and subscribe.